Uh, What's up, everybody? <laughs> oh, God, this chair's so fucked. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> I just fell into it. It's a lot. <laughs> hey, what's up, guys? Uh, how's it going? It's Wednesday night at 10 p.m., so for the moment, that means it's honesty hour until end of March when it becomes vanquished time. I was about to say, is honesty hour turning into a new thing, but all right. It, no, it's been around for a while. Hokey evolution. Been around for a while. Uh, no, it just means at, by the end of the month, I'm going to have to find a different night of the week to do it on. You know, there's only seven. I know. I'm running out of time. <laughs> I'm running out of time so fast. There's not enough hours in the week. And sleep seems to be something that's needed. Yeah. Hey guys, I'm here with Sarah. Hello. Sarah the Rebel. Yes, that one. You guys. <laughs> so, yep, Sarah and some white guy. That forgettable white guy face Sorry here. Sorry my life. Well, yeah. there's like three of y'all that look exactly alike. It's not It's their great. Fault. No, it's great. No, it's got my literal brother that looks a lot like me. Yeah. Just if he was to grow a beard, we'd be fucked. Right. And then we've got Rai Rai. Mm hmm And then we got Dustin. Yep. Great. <laughs> just, no, it's great. It's cool. Wasn't the plan. I would love more doppelgangers. It would be great. I could, I could fool people. Uh, run a Twitch channel, apparently. There's a lot, no. a lot you could do. I need more. <laughs> I need more. I need a lot more of them. Yes, I did get the face paint off my face, and my face burns right now. I'm having some sort of reaction to it, so I feel like my cheeks are on fire. I keep wanting to scratch them. Well... Malika painted my face with eye makeup today. Oh, and you didn't do a little test patch to, to double check? Well, she did a do? test patch on me yesterday, I guess. Oh, and that and one didn't it was burn. Fine. Mm. I don't know if it was her rubbing it all off with olive oil and then putting it back on. I don't know. It's something my face is like, I want to scratch it. I knew she was going to tell me what I was doing wrong. I knew it was. Do you wash your hair with soap too? Sometimes. That's a, that's a thing guys can do that girls apparently. Depends. It depends on how long yeah. it's been since I forgot to wash my hair last. You were just like, oh, I better just handle this. Yeah, right like quick. if I'm washing my face and then I'm like, oh, you know, I could bend down and grab <laughs> the shampoo or I could just, just do this. Just and, and then we're good. We're done. It's true. It's true. Done. I'll try it next time now that I have short hair. There's so many things I haven't tried. Why don't I just try soap? All right, we're doing Try it. soap. It dries your hair out really bad. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. It's <laughs> great. Your hair so is... So great. No. Uh, so, hey, what's up, everybody? How you doing? Um, as you know, we've been doing this. We have been doing this a little different the last couple mm -hmm. weeks. And that we also put it up as a podcast. Hey, look at that. A.R. Henry. Thank you for the follow. Thank you for that follow. So, we also do this as a podcast now. And what that means is once we actually get into it i'll kind of reintroduce it so there's okay. a clear end point and then i'll give a clear out point but however many subscribers we get during the show we'll dance at the end okay good saving all my dance for you right and if last week is indian last week i popped a rib out just sitting here talking to hector so i made him dance the whole time it was fine uh is your rib back yeah it's it happens it's oh. it's a thing okay. it's in out it's fine Ooh. it's whatever uh that's how you make women you know yeah um breaking off rib. yeah i got <laughs> new lady yep that's exactly how it works science <laughs> um so uh but you know first off i want to thank all you guys for tuning in and uh for checking this out um this kind of came together at the last minute because sarah emailed me this morning and said hey i want to be on honesty hour and i was like cool you want to do it tonight because i wasn't planning on it because i have a lot of work to do we have i'm gonna be at emerald city comic con oh, on yeah. friday that is happening. And then I get back here on Sunday and then fly right back up for something super secret. Ooh. And super. then I fly to PAX East and it's just like that time of year where it's like... Yes. It's just cons on cons on cons on cons. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, funny because I've actually been asking Zach to be on Honesty Hour for like two years. <laughs> and now it's like great. When I was a Geek and Sundry and you asked, I was like, oh God. Like, no, there's no way. There's no fucking way. We had to invent staplers because of me <laughs> yeah yeah so you think it was because of felicia incorrect uh <laughs> incorrect and and the main thing with that it was just kind of like i was already towing a very very fine line and they did eventually cancel the yeah, show because they were like fuck this we don't want you doing this but i knew that if i had you on there they would have been like no immediately out you're done you're done because we were the two loose cannons that they yeah, couldn't control that was true um i was screwed ever after after somebody paid pretending to be me Asking to touch Ryan Day's bicep. After that, you know, 
Done. Yes. <laughs> Done. Oh, look, the staplers. Oh. Yeah, so, yeah, a lot of you might not know that, but I met Sarah through Geek & Sundry. You were the uh, social media manager when yes. I started there. Um, when you, I got there, you had been there a little bit. They burned through them, like... Yeah, I... Wildfire, so I, I don't know how many... Yeah, I think I'd been there a year by the time you got there. Oh, wow, already? Yeah, fun fact, I had created the Twitch channel. I think it was a year, because I'd created the Twitch channel a year before, I believe. Mm, that's right, I had to get all the login info and stuff from you. Yeah, because we made it to do, like, a, like an Extra Life thing, but then vloggers are all over the world, and it didn't work. It didn't work cool, out. Cool, cool. Well, let's let's get into the real thing, then. Let's get into the real thing. We'll, we'll, we'll start stupid, but this is how it's gonna work. If you tip or you subscribe, I like, I'll still call you out. I'll say thank you for your contribution, uh, but we'll, we'll do it in a way that keeps it moving. Um, I'll field a lot of questions from the chat room to Sarah so she doesn't have to just sit there and feel like she's gotta talk to you the whole time. Uh, yeah, we'll we'll try to terrible. make it something enjoyable for people to listen to at a later date while still making sure you're a part of the conversation. If you have questions, Put them in the Discord. Now, I know a lot of you don't have questions yet because you don't know much about Sarah, but I'm guessing after the first 30 minutes, there's going to be a lot of them flood the Discord. There's one question. <laughs> <laughs> no, there was, there was none earlier. I was like, hey, where's your questions? And it was just because you've always been a little bit more behind the scenes yes. to, to this community. And I know once we get into it, they're going to fill up because... As you said in your email, you've had a pretty interesting life. So yeah, we'll get into that first, pray. and then we'll get into the mm -hmm. questions. So thank you guys for watching. We'll make sure we, we give proper thanks and everything and all that stuff. So I want to know who did it, Systems and Zen. That's all I want to know. For what? Who, who donated and pretended to be me. I think it was a sizable amount. I think it was like $50. Uh, who knows? If it was now, I'd tell you, I'd be able to like immediately know personality-wise, but that was right when everything started. Right. Who the fuck knows? That was all. Knows? That was all abstract names to me at that point. Now it's like I understand. I can tell you by the tone of, like usually, what who did it. Who done it? Yeah, yeah. Sometimes Arizona White Wabbit think they're clever, but it's like I know it was you. I know it was you. What's that gonna be? Oh, that probably hurts your mic. I'm sorry. Sorry, guys. I'll sing it to you later. Pew pew pew. It's. Piper fine. says no money, so I know it wasn't him. Listen, sorry. Anyway. All right, so. <laughs> Well, let, let's get the for real thing started. Hey, what's up everybody? Welcome to Honesty Hour. Uh, we're going to be talking tonight to Sarah the Rebel. Bing! Sarah. Yes. You only go by Sarah the Rebel. I generally only go by Sarah the Rebel. Is that just an overall branding thing that you decided across the board? Yeah, well, so Makes actually it it's, it's for two reasons. Uh, my last name is, I'll tell you guys because it's in a book now, I can't hide it anymore. My last name's Rodriguez and people think because of that that I am a Latina and, I, and actually that's my stepdad's last name and I'm not, but I look Puerto Rican as all get out, so it just gets confusing. So that's kind of how it became like, no, you do not call me Sarah Rodriguez. Really? So you, what, step? How old were you when your stepdad came into the picture? Uh, well, to like take mother, the last name. <laughs> so my mom was married to him already, and decided him, his best friend and boss, and his wife. They all used to hang out all the time, little little family friends. And then my mom was like, "I want a baby," and that guy, the other guy, was like, "I'll give you a baby." And so they had me and destroyed two families. Uh, and I have a sister who's a month older than me because of those kinds of shenanigans. So I've always had that last name. Isn't that This fun? is already <laughs> fascinating. Let's, let's get into this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like, oh, really? It's interesting. Most times step parents don't, you don't carry the last name well, of a so stepdad, but it's like, oh, now I see it's because your mom had you yeah. with another man. So, but wait, stepdad? Oh, okay, all right. I never used to call him a stepdad. I always was like, he's not my stepdad. He was my, you know, and I would try to explain, but eventually one day I was like, I guess that does really count as a stepdad. Right, because that's a whole other thing to pack. So, he, wait, he's your real father, but you call him your stepdad because he... So, my biological father... Biological father. ...is this Caribbean guy. Okay. I call Cubby. No one knows why. I've called him Cubby my whole life, but he's not named Cubby. Uh, and... Do you know why? Well, I have a theory. Okay. I think that when I, <laughs> I think that when I was little, somebody said, my mom maybe said, "This is your daddy," and I already had a daddy. 
So my brain must have been like, she must have said something else. I'm going to call this man. Okay, wait. Now, what age did you figure out that in this group of friends? Okay, did they all stay friends after this? Or you said it split families up? It destroyed a lot. So what, was he like hanging out at the park and watching you or something? And people were like, I think that's your dad. So Or coming over to awkward dinners? So when I was little, my mom would take me and we would go visit this guy. And... I had a great time at this guy's house because we would watch cartoons, we would play ponies together. This is totally like those scenes you see in movies where the dad's a total loser and the mom brings it by and they're like, don't tell it, it's your your kid. Basically, this was last season on Arrow, but so... that's terrible. I'm sorry. <laughs> I just I just compared your life to Arrow. Well, you know, maybe, maybe. <laughs> I haven't had to kill anybody on the boats yet. Anyway, so one day we were, I remember this vividly. I had to be mm. five years old. Uh, because we left Germany, or at, or younger than five, because we left Germany when I was about five, because I went to kindergarten. In Hold America. on, back it up. You lived in Germany when you yeah, were born. Yeah, I was born in Germany. Cool. Let's <laughs> fuck it. Wait. So this was, and he's Cuban, uh, military no, family, Lucian. or just so yeah, we were both military. Family. Military. Okay, that makes <laughs> a, okay. Now it's coming together. <laughs> back up. Back I, up. Back up. Okay, I like <laughs> this because you're already telling stories the way Malika tells stories, which is always part of the adventure is figuring out what holes and where it all comes together. <laughs> Um, so, uh, one day we were leaving there, and I said, Mom, is, uh, is Cubby related to me? And she goes, he's your father. Just like that. Just straight laced. I bl- I sit there, I remember, staring out at the trees passing by for the whole rest of that trip, just being like... Like, yo, my child brain can't handle this. What? And she swears that she told me before. So, again, this is why I think the okay. confusion of his okay. name... I think when you, I was a baby, she probably was like, this is your father but since i had a daddy it didn't really you were like, come up yeah again. that's my dad i know you're da- that's my dad yeah right cool. so i think just as a younger kid i was completely confused so then I, th- I waited a long time and i was like so i thought daddy was my daddy and she says daddy is your daddy but cubby is your biological father and i was just like and i went back and stared out the window <laughs> 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 just, just, just stared at the trees going, oh. <laughs> okay, cool. We packed, we unpacked that. We're, we're, we got into that. So Rodriguez, biological father. What no. made you, no, Rodriguez, Rodriguez, stepdad, not biological father, biological but father person that raised you till I was five and then they got a divorce. So five years after everything went down, they tried to work it out. So they didn't. <laughs> Cool, they cool, had cool. two other daughters, and they wanted to wait until they graduated high school for the military benefits and whatnot. Mm. So we had even already moved. So they stayed together for them, but not for you. Yeah. And that really <laughs> bothered me as a child. Like, oh, seriously bothered me. I was like, that hey, sucks. you don't love me. Why you want to be in my life? You don't even love me. Cool, you wait for them to graduate <laughs> high school, but I hit kindergarten and all bets are no, off. all bets are <laughs> off for me. Nobody loves Sarah. It's fine. It's okay, fine. okay. So you came over to the United States at the age of five. Yes and immediately lost my English accent because we lived in Virginia. And there's apparently still words that I say wrong that you can just find in random conversation with me because of trying to absorb, no, you're saying and you're spelling these things wrong because my mother is English, my biological father has an English accent. Uh, If you've seen the butler on Fresh Prince, that's actually the accent that he is using the Queen's English Mm -hmm. is because he is also from St. Lucia, so that's how the well-off people in St. Lucia speak. Okay. So... Had an adorable accent, lost it, started speaking terrible English, um, and learned about wrestling. So there were some some good points. I think you, once again, okay, let's fill in all the (laughs) (laughs) in-between. So just five came from Germany, America, lost accent, wrestling! (laughs) Like, life story. Um, I'm actually, I'm going (laughs) to, well, just just to to fill in some holes, I'm just going to base it off the email you sent me, because this is great. Why you're pulling that up? This uh, is the e- this is the email I got this morning, and this is <laughs> this is why it's like, yeah, let's do this tonight. This is great. Um, I've never had someone solicit me to be on this show before. It's usually like, hey, you want to be on us? And they're like, uh, yeah, 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 okay, yeah, that sounds good. That listen, sounds good. How personal are we gonna get? Listen, one of my favorite words is honesty. <laughs> she named it honesty hour. I've yeah. always wanted to be on this show. So. She sends me an email today. It says, random fun facts about my life that will hopefully intrigue you enough to want me on. Because <laughs> I assume you think there's nothing interesting about no, me. No, you know that's not <laughs> true. I, I've had to sit in a car with you for a couple hours before. I, really? I, yeah. We remember company outing? Oh, the dodo. That was a trip, dude. 
a literal trip. That was a trip. trip. I had to that was a trip. from my entire mind until you I just, said I that. just realized no one that worked there at that time still there works anymore. there. So we can talk about it. That was a fucked up trip. Yeah. <laughs> we can talk about it now. It's real. I've never been able to die. I've never been able to talk about this stuff before because I always said like I have friends that work there. I want to respect their working situations. I don't want to like get into that stuff. Yeah, nobody nobody Well, I guess there. technically Felicia's I don't even think still the there. editors are there. No. Oh yeah, Felicia was there. I mean, Felicia upset was there for a little bit. I had, I, mean, I had a little flirty moment with um what was their name's husband? But on accident. Oh, I didn't know about that. Whatever. Anyway, well, it happened while we were all sitting there. Man, everything bad always happened in front of Felicia. <laughs> <laughs> I dig it. Um, back to me. The email she sent. I'm a published author twice now, once by Marvel. I donated my eggs. It was an interesting process. I trained to be a wrestler. I've accomplished three of my four main life goals, currently making some new ones. I worked at Maker, Geek and Sundry, 47PR, and Loot Crate. At Maker, I managed some very well-known personalities such as Markiplier, Lukajin, Trade Chat. I created and ran one of the first all-women staffed video game websites, Nerdy But Flirty. And lots more! <laughs> That's not even touching the dark, life-learning aspects like abuse and whatnot that many women have said helped them when I talked about it. I tried so. to represent everything you said, and when you got to Maker, I was like... <laughs> <laughs> Typing. Um, so yeah, that is actually a very interesting list of things and accomplishments. But let's just—I uh, don't know if you guys know Sherry. <laughs> she used to run Geek and Sundry. I personally never had a problem with her. I worked in the Twitch studio. Sherry did a really good job of making sure everyone else had a problem with me, though, because she liked Lucas and I. <laughs> Which made my life very difficult, because uh, she would say very inappropriate things as a boss and do like yeah whatever. It was like having a tiger mom as your boss is essentially what it was. Like yeah, I, yeah. as a human being, if I was at a party, yeah, me and Sherry could get drunk together, sure. But like as a boss is where it became like, I'm not your kid. <laughs> you have to trust us. <laughs> it's really weird. It worked for me because I never stopped working. Her expectations of other people, though, made that very uncomfortable. It's actually, yeah, it's actually the reason I quit was because uh, we had had the charity live stream. I had just come back from a vacation, which I had told everybody about. I, I asked as soon as I got back, what do I need to know? Can we have a meeting? Can we catch me up to speed? Things seem to have changed. Can you get? I sent all these emails. I actually went to people's offices. I got no response. Something ended up happening. Uh, when I came into work the next day, Sherry was basically like, you didn't stay here 24 hours or however many hours. You, I didn't stay there overnight. So I did a bad job. And that's the moment where I was just like, Goodbye. Yeah, and that made my <laughs> life really difficult because she literally said in a meeting one time, uh, Zach's willing to stay here all night to get stuff done. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. You don't I pay me for that. I remember that, but I think your eyes were like, whoop. <laughs> oh, it's a like, great way to make everyone here hate me. Uh, good job, boss. Well, I definitely didn't hate you. I think plenty of us put the blame where it would go. Uh, yeah, it made things pretty uncomfortable because I, I get that. It's just like, it's like, I'm not doing this to become a teacher's pet. I'm doing it because I have my own expectations of myself that are stupid and I have no life outside of work. That's my decision. What and for a boss to take that as something that's like taking advantage of it to try to use it to get other people to do what they want, I was kind of like, wow, you just put me in a really bad position in this company yeah. and made it very awkward well, for everyone. Even long before you came there, it was something we brought up with her a lot. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, we even tried to get Martin Luther King's day off. <laughs> that was probably one of the, the As you're saying adventures. all this, you guys will notice we don't take any holidays <laughs> off here. <laughs> Everyone works over 12 hours a day. Uh, and now I'm the terrible now boss. Now you're Sherry. Now I'm the terrible That's boss. Wonderful. Yeah. I'm glad I don't yeah. work for you. <laughs> yeah. But, and, you know, people work in different ways. So that's why I love being a freelancer. I was working that entire live stream, for example. It's just when nighttime came, I had a cat, I had things I had to take care of. I was at my house working. I was up that whole night. Uh, and that's how I work now. I'm usually up till 4 a.m. working. Yeah. But if you tell me I have to be in an office the whole time, that's when I just get like, can't, 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 I uh, don't need my cat. I couldn't have done what, there's no way I could have done what you all were doing because, for one, it was miserable in there. <laughs> Two, uh, being on set's a lot different. It's a lot more work in the sense of like how many hours you're there, 
but you you're doing something you constantly. Know, I think that's you're doing something constantly. I do think that's part of sh what, what her viewpoint was, though, because she came from production. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of the the top people in Geek and Sundry at that time, I don't know if it's still the same, came from other kinds of productions where the expectation was that you put in, you pay all the prices right now because oh yeah, you put in you put in the work, you put in the work. And I think it just didn't translate in an office environment. No, it didn't. <laughs> I didn't translate to an office environment either. I can't do office environments. I did not translate at all. Uh, no, couldn't, can't, still don't. I don't translate to office environments. It's actually the problem I, I have sometimes with management from my likes. That my biggest weakest weakness as a manager is I too come from production. Works great for all the talent down here. Right. I have, I butt heads sometimes with people in Seattle because I don't know how to communicate from people with people in a corporate way. And everyone up there comes from a corporate lifestyle. And it's a much more, like there's just, there's certain ways you do it. Right. I'm very used to having talent and individuals who will come up right after a show and be like, how'd I do? Give me critique, feedback, let's do it. How do, all right, cool, great. Moving right. on to my next job, they go do their next thing. And it's just like, it's all very like, you know, production is very, uh, for one, there's a hierarchy and everything always has to be said immediately mm -hmm. and if you're not a part of that hierarchy you're, it's very much like cool not going to listen to your opinion what do you you know like there's right, there's just moving. this you're, you're, moving you're moving so right. fast yeah. you're moving so fast and it's never taken offense to i've been on sets where there's directors throwing shit at production managers <laughs> and yelling at each other and then two hours later being like oh good job guys good job <laughs> like we did it we got through it and it's a hard thing to explain to people who don't live in that world uh in because I think people from the outside that come into it immediately are just kind of like, what the fuck is this? And you don't realize like millions of dollars sometimes on the line. Yeah. And you have a very limited window of right. time to get it done. And the smallest things can fuck all that up. And there's always this pressure, 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 and then rest for a couple months. Yeah. And then pressure, pressure, pressure. And it's, it's really high intensity all the time. And... I had only been in that world for 10 years. <laughs> like, and then I was dropped into an office and I was just like, what the f I don't know how to, I don't, I don't know how to communicate in this world. So the just opposite don't know how to communicate. happened to most of us where we, you know, we had office jobs. We're not producers yeah. and things like that. And we got dropped into that and we're like, are you like kidding us? This is not Disney. I'm not working for Warner Brothers. I like, kept being told that I had to me? respect people's feelings. And I was like, what do you, what do you mean? And they're like, you can't just tell people no. And I was like, well, uh, but it's uh, no, I'm, I'm the showrunner. Can I can I say I no? I got in trouble for being honest. <laughs> and they were like, "No, you can't do that because it's you know in this kind of setting, like we have to re we have to circle back around on it. We work on it as a team." I was like, "Oh, oh, so I'm not the showrunner. I'm confused because <laughs> on a set, like you you know, like on a you know, like on a, a set production, that it's usually yeah, there's teamwork. There's a lot of teamwork, but in the moment, you know, the the first AC knows if he tells the director of photography that like, hey, maybe." Uh, like here's an idea and that and only in close relationships can you get away with that like most of the time a first I see is never gonna give the DP an idea you're gonna do your job mm -hmm. you're gonna do it exactly how you're supposed to do it work quickly and and then communicate what you need to be done to the second AC um, but when you have a really good relationship then it might be like hey you know maybe this one shot might need but what if we tried some movement or something like that? Yeah. But you have to be prepared. Yeah, I was about to say, I can't even imagine. Like, so I would never say You have it. to be prepared <laughs> and immediately ready for that person to go, no, no, we're not going to do that. Let's move on with this. And you go, yes, sir. All right, let's do it. Boom. And, that, and you just, that's just the way it is. So it's that part of, part of the job is rejection. But, and it's not out of personality like rejection. It's right. more it's just, just like we're working things. really fast. And, and the ultimate thing at the end of the day is the DP is the one responsible. Mm -hmm. If it fucks up, he takes the blame for it. Uh, the same goes for director, producer, things like that. So that's why that hierarchy is there and you just have right. to get it done. They, they, they might be the ones that say no, but they're still the ones that are gonna take the fucking fall for it. The right. gaffer and the first, and the grip and all those kind of people, like they're gonna walk away from any movie being kind of unscathed and just be like, hey, I did my fucking job. But those producers, directors, their careers can be ruined. Right. So they have to be able to say no and move on. But you know, <sighs> yeah, yeah. So somebody asked about the dodo bird. So, at this company retreat we went to, there were a few... I forgot all about that. Yeah, I, I forgot until you mentioned that we were in a car together, and I was like, we've never been in a car together. So there were a few presentations, uh, but the most memorable moment of all was when someone who... Imagine he was a finance person. 
because it's a little more complicated than that. But imagine, okay, so like we're all creatives and I'm social media, but this guy's like finance guy. He's very serious. He's not creative or anything. Well, he comes up and he gives this amazing PowerPoint. Uh, like he's in his element, he's presenting, and we're just like, wow, this is like a side of you we've never seen. And then at the end, he's like, and remember, like the dodo bird. And he's got this picture of a dodo bird, and it says, adapt or die. <laughs> Oh god. Maybe I didn't <laughs> find that part weird because I was like, I get it. <laughs> no, it's, it's, we started saying it for the next like month or two. We when someone would say something, we'd be like, guys, we gotta adapt or die. And yeah, it was kind of funny, but it was also like it was true. That's yeah, funny. I mean, that wasn't a weird thing to me. It was going to a horse ranch out in the middle oh, of yeah. nowhere. That made, that made total sense to me. <laughs> Because Sherry likes horses. I was like, wait, I'm working at Geek and Sunday for two months and I'm at a horse ranch right now. What is happening? See? <laughs> like that part, I was just like, wait, what? What are we doing? Wait. I mean, cool. I'll stop in Santa Barbara on the way back. Why not? But well, I, And we could have gone horse riding, but then things happen weird. And that's why I was so sad. But yeah, if you understand Sherry, then the horse ranch made perfect sense. I mean, I was just there to do a job. I mean, any job I've ever had, I took, I look at it like I'm here to work as hard as I can and do as much as I can. But that was the other thing I wasn't used to, is that office environment of like, there's this, there's an expectation of people liking each other. Yeah. I'm not used to that. And I've always been, and, and sets, okay, well that's, production is very much like you have your set friends. And it's like theaters that way, and other jobs like that are that way. Like, you, you're cordial and you make friends when you're on the shoot. And sometimes those are my best friends still now. Like, we still talk, but, but we don't hang out. We work together. And our hanging out comes from this production to this production to this production. Mm -hmm. And that's the other thing that I had a hard time with with the corporate kind of thing. It's like work is work. Hanging out is a separate thing. Mm -hmm. It's like going to get drinks together, going to a restaurant together, going to this thing together, that thing together. I've never been a part of that kind of environment before. And I think that's very common in a kind of corporate mm -hmm. world where it's like you have your work and then, hey, let's socialize a little bit. Let's go do this thing. For me, socializing and work are the same thing. They always have been. It's like... I'm gonna make my friends on set, and then when we're done with that job, we're done. Right. And we might see each other again in a year when we get hired on the same shoot again, be like, hey, cool, we're gonna hang out on this shoot. Great, yeah. but they're 12 hour fucking days. When you get done, everybody's like, get the fuck out, we're done. Yeah. We're out. No, it, it, it was weird for me. It's a reason why I don't do well in office settings, is because I'm always thinking that my work will speak for itself. Because I'm always in the top of whatever. Whenever you mm -hmm. take the, the statistics or the analytics of my work, I'm always at the top. My work should speak for itself. But guess what? Don't nobody like me. So <laughs> it ends up being like, oh, when layoffs come around, it's like, let's get rid of that mouthy chick. She's real mouthy. <laughs> <laughs> like, I would be in the I'm exact honest. same boat. I can't do it. I, I, I know uh, I, was, I, I couldn't do it. We had a, a vice president at Loot Crate one time shush us in a meeting. And I, he's not there anymore. So I'm going to make up. Oh, but his name's so funny, so I want to say his name. Let's uh, don't do name. it. Don't All do right, it. I got it. So I was like, as we've been dropping, shut down. up with your bald head ass, Bill. <laughs> and like, everyone was just like this. And he just giggled and he walked away. And yeah. that was it. And it was, you can't do that, man. This is an office. Why did I tell a vice president to shut up with his bald head? I don't know because it's who I am. I'm honest. Yeah. And not to say that that's the right way to do no, things. No, absolutely don't do that. At work, <laughs> you need to pretend to that's be a better person. That's not the right you are. way to do things. <laughs> I'm not saying that the way I handled things or the way that I did stuff is correct. Uh, I'm just saying that's how I am, so that's what happened. I'm explicitly <laughs> telling you don't be like me <laughs> at work. <laughs> don't do it. If you have the opportunity to socialize and make friends, you should. Uh, don't tell them, no, I'm working, and ignore them for months. <laughs> so Then it's on you when you don't have friends. The way to get around that is keep a little whiskey under your desk. They say, hey, drink. let's hang out, and you're just like... It's the other thing, too. Like, I don't drink. <laughs> I don't smoke. I don't do anything. I don't like to go places. Yeah, you're LA boring. I don't like to do things. I like to work. I like cats. Video games are cool. <laughs> comic books are pretty neat. Talk comic books you, with random people. And sure. sure, you can't just like lean over and read a comic book with somebody. I mean, I've done that. That's, that's how my friends now work. If I have a friend, it's like, hey, cool. I read too fast. No, nah, actually, <laughs> like turn true. back, turn back. I don't know. It, it's just. There are a lot of different expectations from people in those kinds of settings. And, you know, I, I think it is hard for some people because, you know, when you don't fit in like that. And, and, and I think lots of different people don't fit in for different reasons through social mm -hmm. awkwardness, stuff like that. I, I, I've never wanted to be a person that just 
hung out with people and and that did always put me at disadvantage and even from like it, it's weird because sometimes even at like a boss standpoint people expect me like oh everybody's going out for drinks and i'm like i i'm gonna work like there. me working is what allows you to go do drinks <laughs> like that's well just say it like dad daddy's got to keep working that, so you i mean it's, it's honestly true though i mean it's, it's how it works it's like i take time off but then this would all disappear so no but I understand sometimes it's like more or like, you know, like uh, making people happy is important. Yeah, it is. A lot of people feel like they don't have the chance to convince a boss that they might potentially deserve a raise or, you know, show them what good work they do if they don't hang out and drink with them. Luckily, I hung out and drank with the people at Loot Crate way before I ever got hired there. So it was okay. They already knew I was lit. Um, So you worked at Loot Crate and you worked at Maker. Mm Mm-hmm. And what was the other place? Uh, 47 PR. What so the? I got to do the PR for like, what came out at that time? Uh, Raid, Skyrim, Sims 3, Katy Perry specific edition, uh, Syndicate. It was like really cool. Basically, I, m- I moved to LA and immediately did the thing that I had moved out to LA to do. That's cool. Within That's like cool. A month. So you came out to LA to do PR work? Yeah. So uh, I originally wanted to be an actress, right? So I went to school for that. Oh, cool. So you came out here for that? No, actually. Uh, in acting school, they were like, Sarah, you can't act. And I was like, got it. So I switched to PR. Uh, while doing PR, somehow something came up and I was like, wait a minute, video games need PR. And they were like, yeah. And I was like, I'm going to do PR for video games. So I moved out to LA with like 2000 bucks saved up. Cause I read somewhere that's how much you need to like <laughs> kickstart. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> probably should be a little more, right? <laughs> Everything worked out. So <laughs> okay, cool. I'm going to all these events, these networking events, whatever. I'm drinking. And this PR company is like, oh, we could use some new PR people. Now, across the room, there is this other biracial dude, in case you didn't notice by now, because with short hair, apparently I look even less like what I am. I am multiracial. So this guy walks over and he's talking to me. And he, I'm like, yeah, that place said that they wanted me to work there. And he goes, no, 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 no. You are my sister. And I will find a better place for you to work. Because apparently that was a bad PR company at the time. So he makes all these calls, hits all these people up, and I end up working at what at the time was the best PR for video games. Like 47 had all of the big, they had Warner Brothers, they had EA, they had like basically anything that was coming out except I think, no, we had Bioware too because Mass Effect 3 came out around that time too. This so, is like 2010? Sarah don't know years. I think, wait, I graduated in 11, so it would be 2012 and 2012, 13. okay, cool, cool, cool. So you were right around the time of like, WB game. Oh, wow. That's a lot yeah, of big like stuff Batman going on there. Yeah, like Batman came out. Like, I got to work on a mate, and that was within a month. I got hired at that top place and got to do exactly what my dream was and immediately ran into that problem of not paying attention to a work environment where the women were expected to be PR women, not gamers who also did PR. But Interesting, because I feel like that's changed a lot that in the last changed. year. It has, and it's one of the reasons that company is no longer Now, if you don't have... Top. Purple hair and play first-person shooters, you're not in the running. But at that time, they told me, you can wear whatever you want. The guys wore whatever they want, but the women didn't. The women always wore blouses, dressed really nicely, but I wasn't hip to the game. And eventually, they decided not to go forth and hire me after the contract was over because they were like, oh, well, you know, you don't fit in here. (laughs) I was like, I fit in with the, the guys. Guess what? The guys weren't in charge. Anyway. But it was a really awesome experience getting to, to do that and helped me for the rest of my career having that kind of background. Cool, cool. And plus, I got all those free games. Yeah. I was like unemployed, but I had a lot of games. It was really nice. That's how I feel my job is right now. I'm like kind of <laughs> unemployed, know, but, but I have a lot of games. games. <laughs> but kind of employed, it, it just feels like that way because it's like, I still feel like I'm struggling <laughs> always. I think everyone feels that way. Uh, yeah, yeah. For sure. Except me, because money rains down from heaven for me. But uh, everyone else, I think. Oh, cool. Yeah. Great. Uh, so. <laughs> Got to sell your eggs. You did, you did some, uh, you did some egg selling. <laughs> yes. And that's what makes money rain down. A bunch of different things, but that was one in particular. So they pay like. Good money in egg selling, huh? They pay like 6 k Per, per harvest. Yo, dude, you know what I mean. how often can you sell your eggs? Uh, I, pr- not, I don't want to say pretty often, uh, but it wasn't that much time between the two times that I did it. So I, I want to say it was maybe five months between the two times that I did it. And I can still do it up until I turn 30. 
unless I'm specially requested after 30. But yeah, they had this really long process. You had to uh, basically contact everyone in your family, down to cousins on both sides. If you couldn't get in touch with anyone, then you couldn't be an egg donor. Like you had to be able to be like, oh yeah, my cousin from my dad's side died of diabetes. Like you have to answer all these questions. And you had to like take these tests. Like I had to take a psychology, I don't know how to say it, psychiatric exam? I don't know words. I had a psychologist talking to me and I really thought that was when I was gonna be done for because she got real mad at me that I didn't smoke weed at one point. And anyway, uh, it was fine. Turns out I don't have anything bad enough to be a uh, disorder. And cool. So you're just like, I mean, is that okay? Do you, sometimes people are like, I wish it was bad enough that I could just be a disorder so I know what's wrong with me. Now I just have to own up that I'm kind of fucked up. Well, it, it's it's kind of true. Like, I actually do feel mad all the time that uh, me being incredibly angry is never considered a disorder. You're just like, damn it, I just got to control myself. Right. But, shit, get my but, shit together. But that's what they've said my whole life, right? You just yeah. got to control yourself. But when mentally you feel like you can't, like, uh, seriously, I've been around for at least 20 cognizant years and I can't control my anger despite trying all these different things. Are you sure it's not a disorder? But whatever, I also didn't want her to think I have a disorder because I wanted to get that money. So they also did genetic testing. So it turns out if you ever do want to have babies with me, I got some real good genes. I just want you to know. Actually, fun fact, that's part of being mixed. It's one of the reasons why apparently people will find mixed people very attractive is we have really good genes because you balance out You're all You're cycling those, out all the shit. Yeah, all of the genetic things that follow certain races. The more you know. And if you're sleeping with someone of your own race, you're practically creating incest at a biological level. Because we're, we're all related anyway. It's fine. It's fine. Anyway, so then uh, part of donating eggs is you have to give yourself shots in the stomach. It really sucks. They're, you just like, get all hurt. these bruises all Ugh. over your stomach. And the first time you have to do it, you're like, if you've never given yourself shots before, it takes a lot of deep breaths. And they make you do it the first time. They're like, if you can't give yourself shots, you can't donate eggs. So the nurse just stands there like, all right, just you're gonna, come on, I don't have, I have another patient. I need you to do, you're just like, <laughs> what if I hit a vein? Because there's like a 0.0001% chance you can hit a vein and poison yourself. Poison yourself. Because you put, you inject like the, whatever the fuck it is. Uh, and you're supposed to inject it in your subcutaneous stuff, so like your fat. Yeah, I completely understand. But if you hit a like vein, you put that shit in your blood. You are gonna die. Cool, great. If you don't like notice in time to go to the hospital. Sounds like a uh, good good money. And there's a reason eggs. they pay you a lot of money for it. <laughs> I mean, do what you gotta do to survive. I guess I I always wanted to sign up for the medical trials when mm -hmm. I was in college, and I can't because of my genetic disorder. So I, mm. they won't let me. I'm a genetic disorder. Do you have a shirt that says that? Because consider it. I'm a genetic disorder. Yeah, just that. <laughs> Plain white tee. Okay. <laughs> People think it's a band. Oh. And then you'll have like a, a yeah. little icebreaker. I won't even. I won't even get the disability sticker. I'm so like, like ah, I'll beat this uncurable disease one day. Mm. Ah, <laughs> me getting a disability thing is admitting I have Defeat. a problem. <laughs> And Malika's like, no, it allows us to park closer, right. and then you won't whine crazy. later. Yeah, she's like, you then you won't whine, and I'll have, I won't have to rub your knees later because you're whining about it. I'm like, no, it means I've admitted I failed. In LA, Psh, I'd sign up for that. I'm short enough just for that Trader I could Joe's, right? For it. Yeah, yeah, just for Trader Joe's. Crazy. Uh, okay, Malika so didn't give it to me. What made you? Okay, so giving eggs is one thing. What led you to that? Like, what brought you to to be like, you know, were you just like reading a magazine and being like, oh, I'm gonna I need some money, I'm gonna get my eggs. So in college, I saw a magazine and I wanted to do Shit, it. I didn't know I was gonna be that close. Yeah, but <laughs> I forgot. It was like, I, I don't know, I was very lazy, completely forgot about it. I was out here, I was doing something, and a Facebook ad popped up. And now at this time, I'd already decided I didn't want to have kids, but it's like, how dope would it be? I don't have to have kids or raise any children, but there could be little Sarahs running around. That sounds awesome. And <laughs> you, can, you can check mark a Damn box. It. So that when they turn 18, if they want to reach out to you, they can do so. No way. They have to go through like channels. You're stuff. building they, they an army. Through your stuff. You're and literally like, building an Welcome. army. Welcome. Here's some Capri Suns. Tell me about You're your like life. Eight, I have 18 years to establish myself at the top of the chain. When all my little minions <laughs> will come searching for me, I'll be ready to put them to good work. Yes. I'm They'll be looking excited. for jobs. 
The economy will be shit. I could just start we'll have a everything Twitch. they need. <laughs> we'll have everything studio. they need. Like what you're doing with your twins. Uh, oh god. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it is really interesting. It's like, oh man, if I had good genes, would I just hand out my sperm and be like, yo, go make a bunch of sacks, do it? Nah, probably not. I wouldn't do it. I'm super. My mom was very upset. She was like, but what if? Someone does use your egg and there's a little you running around and we don't know about it. I'm like, I don't see a negative in what you just said. <laughs> You're like, you do know it's not actually cloning, right? <laughs> She's like, well, it just makes me uncomfortable to think there's somebody, what, related to us by blood that we don't know who's being raised in a loving family? <laughs> like, Are you ever I like, yo, mom, you didn't introduce me to my dad until I was like five. You want to have this conversation? You're right. <laughs> you You're, You're absolutely right. I, I actually did think what you said. So I have eight siblings, um, none of them full, all of them half. So I did think about that when she said that, where I was just like, how has it ever mattered? Yeah, you, know? the, you spread your eggs internally, I put mine out in the world. <laughs> we, had a, we had a cousin who was actually not the daughter of who she's being raised by. She was the daughter of another cousin who just couldn't raise. You know, like, family is family. You don't, it's not your egg or your sperm. It's more. My dad's shitty. Bless his heart. I like him a lot as a person, not as a dad. But, like, he's not, he even said to us once, he said, so I fathered you, so what? It's like... So I gave an egg. It's not. It's not my daughter. Right. That's someone right. else's daughter. So. Who looks like me? Uh, what led you to, for you know, making a big segue just to get away from this discussion of eggs? You don't like talking about eggs. It's not that I don't like. I just could see this taking up a full hour of just like <laughs> diving into this world of Genetism. selling eggs. Yeah. They uh, made me carry my pee outside into another building. P.S. Okay, sorry, go ahead. That sounds... It was so embarrassing. Uncomfortable? Was it like a campus downtown, or...? I don't remember. Where was it? It's... Uh, I can't remember parts of town, because I don't drive. It's somewhere south of here. Do you Uber and Lyft everywhere? Yeah. Damn. Or get a... Uh, I'm so surprised there's like three or four other people that, that uh, host shows here that do that. I'm like, how the fuck do you afford it? We don't pay you guys shit. So it's... Tech, so depending on your situation, it can actually be way cheaper. Than if you do like the group thing? So or? like I always do pool and I don't have a car that I have to worry about parking. So I never have to pay for parking. I don't have to pay for accidents. I don't have to pay for insurance. I don't have to pay for gas. So if I'm going a certain number of places a certain number of times a week, totally cheaper than having a car. And it evens out? Yep. Now the bus would be cheapest, but this place is just a little too far away from the nearest bus stop. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Lancashire and... Uh what are oh, you bus stop! People? I don't need. <laughs> don't come find me at the bus stop. <laughs> North Hollywood, Lancashire. It's only like four miles from here. Good luck. <laughs> so, I mean, it's not very close. I'll be there though. <laughs> um, so, uh, making a terrible segue uh, into the next subject before we get into questions. Um, you you are a host. Oh, they're, 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 the, the little thing's getting smaller, which lets me know there's more questions down there. Um, you're a host on a new show here on Hyper mm -hmm. RPG. Uh, ready to ready to ramble. Yes, I've said it wrong 14 times on video already. Great. <laughs> ready to ramble uh, on Saturday now, which is a wrestling show, which is something I said we would never ever do on this channel. Yes, yeah, so the person named Kirby it. is very angry about this whole thing. Uh, you know, and honestly, know the man. best thing you guys had going for you was me knowing how much it would upset Kirby. <laughs> Is that why and you I did am it, that, just to spite him? I am that, that person. Well, then when, it was, when you guys came to me and I was like, you know what, I really don't want to have a wrestling show, but Kirby's in Chicago and can do nothing about this and will hate it, uh, we should do this. This would be great. Thanks, This man, would be really Kirby. great. So thank you, Kirby, for taking one for the team. Uh, <laughs> no, just... It, I, I don't actually have a problem with wrestling. Almost everything we do on this channel is a bit. Um, I don't watch it because I don't have time to watch it. It is very time consuming. I don't fucking have time to get into a whole nother bullshit thing. Raw is like three hours long. <laughs> Not gonna do it. I don't have Raw. time. I don't have time. Uh, but, you know, people like it and people get into it and that's, you can't diss what somebody else likes unless their name's Kirby. So, um, what, of it, what originally led you to wrestling and what got you so into it that you decided to become a wrestler yourself? So, it actually happened in waves. First, when I was little, this is a terrible story, by the way. So, when I was like five, my neighbors used to, there were two boys, they used to hang out and they used to wrestle. And they had like the little pillows, that, the wrestling pillows. If you've, no, if you've ever seen them, you know what I'm talking about. And they had like Hulk Hogan and somebody else. 
and I was basically the girl valet. If they won, I went off with the winner. And sometimes we made out in a closet, and I was five, and it was terrible. And that's what we learned from wrestling, kids. Anyway, making out in closets. Yeah, it was. That was a wrestling bad thing. Bad because little kids don't know that they're breast. Eighties. That was like or nineties, I guess. Yeah, early nineties. I was just like, oh, you're, you taste like burrito. This is the worst. Anyway, so fast forward. Uh, one day I'm flipping through the channels and I see China in the middle of a ring. Now China looks like Xena. China yeah. is amazing. China is strong. And to me, beautiful. I ain't gonna argue with you if you say she's ugly. I'm gonna tell you go fuck yourself. Um, but like, she was everything that I pictured myself being in my head, even though I wasn't. <laughs> like mentally, that was Sarah, big strong woman beating the crap out of people. Um, and so that got me back into wrestling. Then there was The Rock and Jericho, and everybody was so funny and interesting. I feel like The Rock's one of those guys that you can't not like him. Yeah, if you don't like so him, like the most wrong with charismatic you. motherfucker I've ever seen on camera or. Wherever you just even when they're doing like the like people reacting to the Oscar situation, they show pictures and you just see him in the background like like giving his eyebrow, looking. I'm like, is he always doing the thing? Is he like? Did you see his post where he said he thought that somebody was basically pulling a Kanye West and he was about to leap over Meryl and tackle that producer? <laughs> <sighs> uh. Yeah, I think he's the most likable. Like like entertainer not just yeah. wrestler he's a likable entertainer which is why it was so easy for him to probably cross Over, yeah. wherever does he still Scorpion do the wrestling King. thing every once in a while he will show up so he showed up uh last not this monday that just passed but the monday before that at the staples center show because he's filming a new wrestling film and so he got the audience like involved and everything he's producing it the bastard I wasn't there. I was at San Diego's live event instead of being... Okay, look, it's fine. I'm not upset. Now, anyway. Going back to it. So you got into it around that time. You got back into but it. And then stuff got weird with the women uh, because it was the Attitude Era. So they used to have like bikini contests and mud wrestling and all this stuff. Or eventually it just got to the point where it felt like, like I kept getting too mad watching it. So I stopped watching it. And then I got back into it uh, a few months ago, actually. Maybe like a year ago now at this point. And... I was at a show in Anaheim. It was my first time ever going to a show because when I was little, uh, Eddie Guerrero used to ride, uh, when he came to Hampton, he used to always ride a lowrider in as his entrance. And when he came to Hampton, Virginia, which is where we lived, my brother had the only lowrider club. And so my, he actually rode my brother's lowrider in. Oh, that's cool. And I was like, oh, do I get to go, blah, blah, blah. And they were like, nah, you know, the homies are going. You're a kid. You don't get to go. Now I look at all these children there with these $200 seats, and I'm like, I hate you, family, but it's fine. Um, so I never got to go to any live shows, but I was at this Anaheim show because I was like, wait, I'm an adult. I have money. I can, I can go to a show. So I went to a show, and somebody put a flyer on the, um, the car about a wrestling school. And I was like... So this is your first show you went to? You found the flyer? Mm-hmm. Again, living that movie lifestyle. <laughs> my life is a movie. Go went, ahead and Went to that it. first show. See the flyer. This is my life now. I was just... Why did I never think of being a wrestler? I hmm. like to hit people. I used to get suspended from school for fighting constantly until they implemented that 10-day suspension rule. And then after you do that once, they'll hold you back. So anyway, long story. Um... I used to fight all the time. I wanted to be an actress, but wasn't quite good enough to be a real actress. Like, this is, has my name written all over it. Why didn't it occur to me that I could actually be a wrestler? And then I remembered, oh, because back then wrestlers were like models, except for China, who was really big. I'm not very big. So I think back in the day, I wanted to be a wrestler and was like, oh, I can't do that. So, unfortunately for me. How do you feel now about that, going through school, getting in the ring a couple times? Like, do you, do you feel now like you're like, yo, fuck the image, you know, like I can kick some ass in there? Like, Well, it's actually more about the change in the women's division of wrestling. It's, it has changed a lot. Now, mm -hmm. uh, you, you can't just be really pretty and be a wrestler. You actually have to have skill. And there are some quite ugly women <laughs> wrestling now, finally, in the WWE because they're starting to recognize skill instead. However... Uh, I've learned that I actually don't think I can be a wrestler. Uh, not because of my looks or my boobs, because all I need is a push-up bra, uh, but because I'm too afraid to do a lot of things. Jumping off the top rope, frog splashes, heck, sometimes even just taking a proper heel drop, I'm just like, ah, this is so scary. And it freaks me out, so I'm actually trying to be a manager now. Cool, which cool. Which would be like, like the valet people. Like what Austin Creed mostly does. Except he also wrestles sometimes. But I can do a backbreaker. 
Every once in a while, just to remind people, keep them on their toes. A lot of this conversation has gone way over my head, and I'm comfortable with that. I can show you. It's okay. I'm broken <laughs> everywhere inside. You can see my matches if you go to YouTube. I have a, I think I have a playlist called Sarah on the Internet, and I'm pretty sure I put my two matches in there. But if not, if you go to Santino Brothers, uh, if you search Santino Brothers and Sarah, oh, I have man, didn't we talk on there. one point about like if we reach a certain donation goal, you you guys would teach a move on the show? Yeah, we can still, but we talk would have to that. reach a donation. Maybe goal I didn't bring it back it. up for <laughs> yeah. Maybe I didn't bring it back up because of insurance region reasons. That could have been it. Well, they actually yeah. can make you sign things, and you know, okay, we can talk about it some other time. But they, I mean, if you're in my company and you break something, I don't want to be liable for that shit. Am I in your company? I won't break nothing. It's Iffy and Cameron. What could they break? It. <laughs> I wrestle guys bigger than Iffy. <laughs> it's Iffy and Cameron. What can they break? Just take out Cameron in that sentence. It's <laughs> Iffy. What can he break? It'll be fine. He's broken everything I've ever let him touch. <laughs> it's just, it's got to be a lot of things. We don't let him touch a lot oh, of okay. things. Okay. <laughs> like that. Because he's broken everything. Yeah. The dude's. Okay, I can do it to Cameron. He's a lot heavier than he looks, and our furniture can't handle him. He is meaty. He's very meaty. Thick boys. God. <laughs> Seriously, everybody knows. He breaks everything. Every chair, couch, it doesn't matter. Whatever. Um, okay, well, so now you're looking to get more into management type stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I had a referee class the other day with the same guy who refereed the Undertaker's Shawn Michaels match, which was like... One of the considered one of the best matches of all time, so that was also really cool. So you say you went to like one match, then you started going to school, and this is a thing a lot of us nerds can relate to. So like you you dip your toes in, and then you're like, and yeah. you just, I just you're in. diving because you're bringing up matches that you had like you've done your you're doing research. You're like you're digging in. Right. You're 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 becoming a part of the world. And in fact, I just remembered this was pretty cool to me. So that same night that The Rock showed up. Um, a local wrestler got to wrestle. They're called jobbers when they're not like um, a name. And she wrestled one of the really strong girls to make her look strong. That's the girl who you'll, when you find a video of me wrestling, that's the girl I'm wrestling against. And she got to be on Raw. Like it, it was crazy how quickly, and people have already offered me referee work, even though just meeting me at that one session. Like the wrestling world is kind of wide open if you're willing, like everything is available to you. It's small. Yeah. I'm guessing it's, it has a high dropout rate. Oh, yes. It seems like one of those industries where people say they want to do it, start doing it, and they go, holy fuck, this is a lot of work. I injured myself about three times within three months. Oh, yeah. Our class started with 30 and was down to four. It was just me and these like three guys at the end. <laughs> and uh, one of the guys is like a gym rat, like perfect body. I used to love when he put me in a little chicken hold. I could feel his abs on my back, and I was like, this is the best. Uh, the other guy's like a football player, and the other guy's like an actual like wrestler, right. like high school wrestling. And then there was me. And you know, the first time I injured myself, it was from getting up. The second time I injured myself, from getting up. That sounds like my, I, I just, I breathe sometimes, <laughs> or I get out of a chair and I'm, I fall like, apart. Yeah, like your ribs, apparently. Yeah, yeah. Today it's my knees, so you'll probably see me nursing this thing. I did, and all I did today was sit. I couldn't do wrestling. Yeah, not at no. all. Now, people were really concerned for me when I was wrestling. I mean, we showed a couple pictures, like, just covered in bruises every single day. Oh, yeah, yeah, we saw those, yeah. Um, I was limping around work when I injured myself. Basically, I, uh, the, this, what's it called? Quadratus lumborum. Sounds like a that magical one. spell. That one. But it's like a big muscle down your back. One went, and then the other one went for the next injury, which apparently is common. Uh, but you can't walk without that muscle. <laughs> So I was like trying to hobble around work and everyone's like, Sarah, please stop. You know, people were sending me messages like, I think they're pushing you guys too hard. Like it was, it was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Uh, so I don't even fault the people who drop out. Like all oh, those weaklings, it's like, it's, it's way it's harder easy. than you think it is. I mean, it's obviously a very physical sport. Um, and people think it's fake, which drives me nuts. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's theater. It is theater. It's extremely, but in extremely theater, physical theater. You're not going to get like hit in your jaw you're not going to get kicked in the back you're not going to have to constantly throw yourself onto the ground like it all it's they're taking real risks and hurting the crap out of themselves every single day yeah oh you found the video yay uh thank you powerbog for that subscription by the way we'll make sure that we give you a proper welcome at the end of the show um so let's that th we've covered some of those things mm -hmm. we covered those and that's kind of like 
right now that's where you're at you're in this like you're you're you want to be a manager you're hosting for us so you, you have any other hosting jobs that you do uh so i do my own podcast that's right yeah and, and you have the woman up yeah podcast? so i had the woman up podcast for a long time uh we just ended it uh a month ago two months ago i don't remember um but now I'm working on Women Wrestling Friends, which is kind of the more mm -hmm. wrestling-focused version of that show. We've got a few other podcasts lined up. And then I'm also writing books. One with my cousin, where we just realized one very important part of our plot makes no sense, so we're probably going to have to rewrite all, what do we have, about 30,000 words right now. <laughs> Yay, writing. Um, why don't you tell us about your books? So you did one that was, I didn't know you have, you've got two published. I know about the Agent Carter. Right, so uh, Agent Carter Season 1 Declassified is the book I published with Marvel. Basically, one night uh, I was at the movies watching Mockingjay, I think it was called. I don't, I don't know what the Hunger Games are. I was there because it was free, a free date. I got a call, so I'd go to the bathroom, and I'd missed it. It was a message. Hey, Sarah, this is so-and-so from Marvel. I'd like to talk to you. Call me back. And I was like, maybe they have the wrong number. I was like, no, they said my name. They don't have the wrong number. I would probably freak the fuck out. I freaked the fuck Someone out. Someone was like, hey, Zach, it's so-and-so from Marvel. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. I freaked all the way out. So I called back immediately in the bathroom of the theater, and she didn't answer, so I left a message. Next day, she calls me again. I'm at work at Geek and Sundry. I missed the call because I'm in a meeting. She leaves another message. I am all the way freaking out at this point because, oh, no, Marvel has called me, and I've ruined my one chance to work with Marvel. Anyway. I end up talking with her eventually. We get in touch. Turns out somebody had put my name forward as a writer. Oh, cool. So they reached out to me. They were like, yeah, we see your website and everything. Do you think you could write a book? I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can. Sure. Yes. I can definitely write a book. Like, are you sure? Because it's like a lot of different. Yeah, yeah. Nope. I got it. I could write a lot. Uh, I was wrong, by the way. Because, <laughs> uh, you know. Cause I remember you used to take off early to go to set on Agent Carter. Yeah, I was like on the set. I was speaking with like all the actors. Let me tell you, the best part of the whole thing was Haley Atwell gets introduced to me. She's lovely. She's everything you could imagine, right? And then maybe an hour later, uh, James Darcy, who plays the, the like butler kind of guy, comes in. And she's like, James, have you met Sarah? The lead actress of the show took it upon herself to introduce her co-host to me. Like, that's just the, she was in the Rise of the Prey. She bought us a lobster truck and we hugged so much and I taught her about the Sims. Anyway, it was the best. Had nothing to do about the fact that you were writing a book about her, right? She didn't even know. She, it was funny. They, oh, yeah? They, uh, they thought that she wouldn't want that much to do with the book. They thought they were really going to like have to do a lot to get her to agree to stuff. Yeah, I can see that because it's kind of like one of those things that you're like, eh. I don't know. I, I guess, I don't know if maybe they just didn't talk to her that much because if you talk to her, it's very obvious. Like she's She goes 100% in for anything. And I was like, I'm pretty sure she'll write the forward. They were like, Sarah, shh, I, I know you think very highly of yourself, but there's no way she's going to write the forward. And she totally was like, can I write the floor? <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome. She could write the floor. Um, she, she was just amazing. And uh, they played all sorts of pranks on each other on set. So yeah, I was working at Geek and Sundry. And then I would get off work uh, on days where I didn't go to set. I would get off work at like 6, get home, eat some food. At 8 p.m. I would start writing. I would write until 7 a.m. At 7 a.m. I'd take a shower and go into Geek and Sundry. And I would do that for like three days in a row where I would get no sleep. And then I would sleep a bit and then do it again, like sleep for one day and then do it again the next time. Uh, it was the second hardest thing I've ever had to do uh, because I, I didn't realize when they said you have three months to write the book. It's not very much time. Well, on top of that, it wasn't actually even three months because they, I had to wait until filming started. So I was on the film schedule, not on my own. So I can't write anything about the book if I can't interview the people, if I can't go to the set, if I can't get the content. And so that's what I didn't understand about the writing process. So I was wrong. I could not write them this book. Uh, but I made it happen. And I'm, they will never call me again. I'll tell you that. Oh, I, they won't call you again? I'm pretty sure I got that book in like a day late. I'm 90% I'm oh, sure. Oh, nice. Yeah. But again, if, things, if the timeline had been what it was supposed to be, I think I could have done it no problem. But it ended up me basically having a month. And I had about mm, 10 hours of things to transcribe. Yeah, it was uh, it was way harder than I ever thought. They gave me almost too much information, but it was yeah. a 200 something page book. That's a lot. That's not that's not very, that's not a little content. Right. Especially for something that you like it would actually be easier to write your own content to do that because you it's just coming from you. You don't have to rely on anybody else. 
Um, so my second thing is actually uh, part of an anthology. And it's basically somebody was like, I'm tired of all the short stories being like castles and knights and stuff. So let's make an anthology about fantasy that's not Western fantasy. You can't have any knights, can't have any castles, none of this stuff. Um, and so my short story, Pride of Katush, is in there. And y'all should get it because it's only $2.99 on Kindle. And I would like to know what you think about my amazing story. Go for it. Do it. Do it now. Uh, so what's it, I mean, what's it like writing for a big poster? Like, that, that's a lot of pressure. I mean, you oh, say, yeah. like, you got in a day late, but it's like Marvel for a show that you were a fan of mm -hmm. with, you know, actors and actresses that you're a fan of. Like, that, that sounds like a lot of pressure. It was. It was uh, terrifying sometimes. Because, like I said, so even if I didn't have a job and was just writing, it would have been a lot. But going to work every day and then coming right. home and writing, it was terrifying. I, was, I got to a point one night where I was just sitting there. I wasn't even writing. And my roommate comes in and he's like, what's up? And I'm like, I, <laughs> I don't think I just did that. Uh, because I wondered, can I even get this in on time? It feels like a mountain of work. Now, I since learned that you can actually turn transcripts into certain places and they'll turn them around pretty quickly for a certain amount of money. That would have saved me like 80% of the time for writing. Um, but going on set and interviewing people when you've never done that before, I was, I was scared every time I talked to somebody. I felt like... I couldn't remember everybody's name. I felt like I might be in the way. People are filming things. Is it rude to get up and leave while someone's filming something? Because I'm real bored. Like it was, it was a lot, and it kind of taught me a lot very quickly. But it was, it was very scary and very fun. And I'm you just stand right in somebody's eye line and just be like, <laughs> just, is this okay? Uh, I, I was like writing, you know, writing all yeah. the time, and sometimes they come by and be like, "You didn't write that down, did you?" Because they talk about like their dildo pranks and stuff, and I'd be like, "Yeah, I totally wrote that down. I'm not gonna put it anywhere, but I wrote it down." <laughs> Just to let you off know. the record. Tell me more. <laughs> they uh, they had something called a murder nook that they would do, and they called it murder nooking. They turn it into a verb where you hide in a good place for hiding, and you leap out at somebody while they're working late at night and scare the bejesus out of them. And I almost got murder nooked once. That doesn't sound very interesting uh, <laughs> s or safe. Uh, uh, okay, so let's. Once you've been murdered, Nick. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> um, all right, so we've gone through some stuff. I think it's time that we start diving into some questions from the chat room, which always ends up leading to more things Yay. And, and stuff that we haven't talked about. Oh, um, yes, go to my Patreon, patreon.com slash Sarah the Rebel, and give me money so I can send you my short stories. <laughs> Thank you, person in chat. <laughs> Who said it? Parvus said Potin. Okay. Um, uh, do, 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 do. Uh, well, the first question has nothing to do with this interview, DJ Blue. Don't, come on, damn it, DJ Blue. Uh, yes, you are also obviously welcome to you stop by. You can't say hi to me. Um, Jabberwockied. So Sarah, what are your goals with your wrestling training? Are you enjoying the training? And is your goal to join a promotion? So just answered that, yeah. So I'm yeah. definitely I am trying to become a manager, which will involve uh, going to a lot more places and, and talking to people. Ultimately, my dream would actually to be a be, to be a commentator on WWE, to basically be Byron Saxton. You don't know who he is, but nope. sometimes they call him Booty Saxton. It's really fun. So much of your wrestling talk just goes. <laughs> I'm, I'm very, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm so out of touch with that. Just tell everyone you know a girl named Suplexia. That's not my name, but it would be fun. So yeah. they would look at me like you're an idiot. That girl doesn't exist. No, no, they, they pretend they knew who I was. Oh. <laughs> um, Come on, this is L.A. The uh, Moon Rules says, if you could go back in time and watch one person sneeze, who would it be? Oh, I fucking hate sneezes. Nobody. What a silly question. That's a great answer. <laughs> uh, Sarah, can you pitch what Zach's wrestling persona would be, including a description of his entrance and finishing signature moves? Yes, he would be the glass man. God damn it. And he would come out all wrapped up like a like a mummy <sighs> with like the sticks on the end so he could like walk. You know, like the old school cartoon version of a person who has broken every bone in their body. And he would hobble out there and be like, but I have heart. And then, you know, he'd be a face, of course, because the people would get behind him as, as slowly, somehow, against all odds, he would manage to defeat opponents. I think he'd have to have a really nice name, like, uh, like James the Glass Man. Great. <laughs> Great. 
Gundam Mac actually just tipped $10 and says, Sarah the Rebel, who's your favorite wrestler and why is it Bailey? <laughs> hashtag I'm a hugger, hashtag hug life, hashtag Sarah's rule, Gundam's niece, Aww. Sarah. Um, it's because, okay, so you know why I love Bailey? Because Bailey is somebody that girls get to look up to. She's not, so to explain Bailey to you a little bit, she's not like, I'm sexy. She's not like, I'm strong like China. She's not big like Nijax. She's literally just a soccer kid, like a girl who played soccer in your high school with the headbands and everything. Like, sh that's her persona. And it's so positive and joy-filled, and she's always hugging people. So she's really easy for little girls to relate to. And anytime you go to a show, you'll see like 20 little girls dressed as Bailey, which I think is awesome. Giving them somebody to look up to instead of like, I want to be real hot and have fake titties like her. I think it's a good thing. There we go. Uh, wrestling on other things. Tea and cake or death? What does that question even mean? I like tea a lot. I'm not a fan of cake. Do I have to die? I, death sounds pretty great sometimes. <laughs> I could rest. Yeah. I know what you mean. The Moon Rule says, do you have any problematic favorites when it comes to wrestling? Oh, yeah. I'm sure I do. Uh, Jackie was one of my favorites, uh, Miss Jackie. And she would often come out in uh, things that were just like barely covering her nipples. <laughs> Uh, and I still loved her anyway because she was a black woman who could really wrestle. And as a kid, I didn't feel like I saw that anywhere else. Eventually, a lot more black women started joining um, the WWE. And for a while, we had her and we had Jazz and we had, I think, Booker T's wife. But originally, I was just like, oh, my God, we wrestle too. That's exciting. I see here that uh, in, in Discord, DJ Blue just dumped a ton of questions and then probably went to bed. Aww. Uh, <laughs> um Sarah, do you feel that the ancient Olympics would have benefited from your skill as a wrestler? Absolutely. I'm actually a very natural, real wrestler. Fun facts. I used to beat boys all the time. <laughs> they were like, what? How? Because I'm a natural. I'm not as good at fake wrestling. <laughs> um, gosh, so many of these questions. You have such a more interesting life. I wanted to sit here and ask you questions about wrestling that we've kind of all covered. Um, let's see... Someone on uh, another thing asked me how I met Tasty Steve. Uh, I heard, I loved his commentary. Every single time I heard his voice, I knew it was him because I think he's one of the best commentators in the FGC right now, uh, fighting game community. And I was at an event and he was standing there and I was like, Steve, be my friend or something like that. I don't know. You know me. I just run up and say stuff to people. Uh, we started speaking and then we became friends. That's how I become friends with everyone. I'm not very subtle. <laughs> I say, hi, will you be my friend? And they either say, yeah. And I know that they don't it's the mean the opposite it. of I interact with people. I don't say like, anything. Please don't be my friend. And then I especially don't ask them to be my friend. Um, That's true. The only time I ever liked you was when you were dressed as like Luigi. That's the only time I ever felt like, oh, I really like Zach. I never dressed as Luigi. Mario, maybe? It was Mario. I don't remember. It was, a year, it was years ago. It was, technically, mm -hmm. plural. My cat is named after Bailey's Irish Cream, to answer that question. Okay, um, let's see, there outside was actually There's an outside of wrestling stuff question. Yeah, what other passions or hobbies do you have currently? Is there anything else you were learning uh, on top of the wrestling training? Mm. My, my other hobbies are writing and gaming, of course. Uh, I feel like writing is a constant learning process. Oh, I'm specifically trying to learn how to write shorter short stories. What's really hot right now are flash fiction stories because you can just email them to people every day and then I guess you get a lot of signups to your website. Flash fiction stories? Yeah, so it'll be like a hundred words. Like tell a story in a hundred words. I find it incredibly difficult. I have a hard time staying under the 4,000 word mark for short stories. Uh, so I've been researching other people who write short stories and advice and tips. It's been really cool and I actually on Patreon I submit I shared my first actually short short story and then I sent off an even shorter one to a uh, to a place so hopefully it gets picked up that's actually really neat that's I I mean obviously that shit has to happen it just makes sense but I didn't know that there was this community of people just like what do you do people just like sign up on a list and then you send them yeah so you you find that there's various websites that do it and uh, some people do it on tumblr there's some twitter ones called mini fiction um and yeah so i basically get emails once a week no i have one that's daily i have one that's once a week and they just share a story every day and then a little bit about the author it's, it's really neat. cool it's great for people who are busy <laughs> like me like most people right You're, you don't have time to really 
dive into a story unless no, we set aside time. I mean, I understand PR for gaming mm -hmm. and writing, and, uh, but we didn't really talk about how did you get into like social media stuff, like doing social media work for companies? Uh, how did I get into it the first time? Um, I think I lied my way into it. Yeah, yeah, I did. Okay, so I've always done social media just on my own been pretty great at it. I mean, the whole reason my website even did anything, the whole reason um, I ended up meeting the right kind of people to move out to LA, like all that stuff was through social social media, but just for my own stuff. And so I got hired at Geek and Sundry to run their vlogger uh, channels, to be their, the, basically the manager of that network that they had created, because that's what I used to do over at uh, Maker. And uh, eventually the social media person left and I just pitched really, really hard for myself until they gave me a chance and let me do social media. And then that's when everybody got to see what I've been saying all along, which is that I'm really good at social media. So then uh, I currently run five social media accounts. I can't tell you about all of them, but I can tell you about Joko Cruise, which is a cruise for geeks that you should go on or at least I follow like, on I Twitter. I like when you say you can't tell us about all of them. What? Because it's honesty hour? No, I just... Like, running other people's Twitters is one of those jobs where I'm just like, God, that's got to be so much fun, but also stressful. Yes, and some places don't like people to know who's running the social media because then they feel like it's not the company anymore. Yeah. But then that makes me mad because when I see people who are like, this company shouldn't have said this or this company shouldn't have got involved with that, I'm always like, that's a person running an account. That Most person likely. had an opinion, cared about something, wanted to share it with you. Like, oh, it gets me so frustrated. So I like ones that are like, yeah, just sign your name at the end or, you know, be honest that there's a person here that you can also build a relationship with. My favorites are older celebrities that hire someone to run their Twitter for them as and speak as them. Yes, it's always very amazing. <laughs> it's amazing. I love that you could tell that Prince make is doing Make them think I'm more witty. Stuff. Make them think I'm more witty. Make, make them like me. You could always tell Prince was running his own stuff because most of his tweets made no sense. It was like when you hand an old man a phone and you just like, here's where the eye emoji is. He was like, yes. Eleanor Rose says, Hyper RPG now has a book club. So do you have any books you would like to recommend for us to read? So many books. So you seem like you're a big reader. Yes. And writer. Yes. I so. have like 300 books last time I cataloged them. And I cataloged them fairly often. Um, so it depends on what you like. So I'll name just a few of my favorites. But I actually have a vlog on my channel where I actually really go through my favorite books and why. And so that might actually be more helpful if you're really looking for a suggestion. Um, but currently, uh, the Crown of Stars series, the Inheritance Trilogy by N.K. Jemisin. Uh, if you like young adult, I really love Alana, Song of the Lioness Quartet. Uh, the Malazan Book of the Fallen has been my most successful recommendation to anybody. It's a series uh, sort of based on a D and D campaign that they had, and you can really tell it when when you're reading. Sometimes you'll just be like, "Oh, like seven books in," you'll be like, "Oh, these are orcs," but you didn't know they were orcs. It's amazing. Malazan Book of the Fallen by Eric Stevenson. Steven Erickson? I don't remember. Look it up. Gardens of the Moon is the first book. Interesting. Again, another topic. <laughs> Sorry, I love comics. Uh, so I love real books. I love fantasy. I, I like to read about women and people of color holding swords. It's very specific. And so, <laughs> <laughs> like, this is what I want. Yo, Steven anyone Erickson of color place. holding a sword in that book? No? That I'm not going to like it. The same thing when people are like, Sarah, did you watch this show? I say, does it have dragons? And they say, no. I'm the exact opposite. <laughs> I'm like, does it have dragons? And they say, yes. I'm like, eh, I'm probably not going to be into it. It has to have a dragon. I'm not a fantasy guy. I like sci fi. I'm a sci-fi person. I will take sci-fi. That's usually the series. Is there a dragon? No. Is there a spaceship? No. Is there magic? <laughs> like, you gotta give me Yo, something. but who's fucking? <laughs> but who they fucking know? Because then I might check it out. No, that's... It's like... Uh, I don't know. I, I can't... I just can't get into fantasy. I've tried. I've tried many times. The closest I've got to really liking fantasy is Lord of the Rings stuff. Because I, I grew up reading it. Right, you know? so it has a nostalgia element. So There's the, a nostalgia element. The Silmarillion is the book that actually made me think I could be an author. Because um, for anyone who doesn't know, the Silmarillion is kind of like a, a bunch of his ideas and backstories and everything put together. So I'm reading the Silmarillion. Cool, it's like reading the Bible. I was way too young. Uh, and I get to the back of the book, and there's an appendix. And there was all these random things that he had drawn, that he had talked out, that he had put into charts. And I had like 
three thick folders full of those things for the stories that I created in my own head. And like, who begat who, and whose weapon is what, and what's their symbol, and if they were to fight this person, like I had just charts and charts and charts, and that's when I was like, oh, maybe I could be an author. Like, I have all this stuff. I have the Silmarillion so for my stuff. And I'm actually, the, the story that I was created back then has influenced one of my novels that I'm working on right now. So you're currently working on a novel. I'm working on three. <laughs> three novels right now. When do you plan on having them done? Mm. Ever? Well, you know. The, Just like a life goal thing? The is one of your life goals? That is one of the life goals. But I actually made the life goal, which was to write a book. I didn't know how many books I'd want to write. Which brings us right to our next. That was a perfect oh, segue. Okay. That was on purpose. Cupcake Theory. We went to Cupcake Therapy. Uh, says, what life goals have you accomplished already? And what new ones have, give, have you given yourself? Uh, doing, writing a book. Do, writing a book. Doing PR for a AAA video game. Uh, and writing for a video game. So I, I wrote for Heroes Charge and for Blade Sword of Elysian. And that was a really big moment for me because I, that was something else that I didn't think I'd ever get to do. So I think <laughs> I need some new goals. So I'm working on those. Okay. And, and you said you need new? I thought you had some new ones. You're just, you're working on. Yeah, because I feel like if I've reached my goals so easily and so quickly, then perhaps my goals weren't hard enough. And it was based on a conversation I had with my ex-sugar daddy. Uh, so he's like, well, why don't you make a goal to be rich and famous? And I'm like, because it's not actual. And I was like, you know what? Maybe I should. Because then I, it would actually give me something. Oh, but you're just calling your sugar daddy. Ex-sugar daddy. Oh, ex-sugar daddy. And he was telling you, why don't you make your goal rich and famous? You're like, because I have a sugar daddy. No, that he's an ex-sugar daddy. Okay, but at the moment. At that moment when we had that conversation, he was an ex-sugar daddy. Oh, he was already an yes, ex-sugar yes, daddy. Yes, yes. Oh, okay, okay, okay. He still okay. calls and gives me life advice and talks to me like a goddamn dad. It's the worst. <sighs> That's the nature of sugar daddies, kids. They sound like a great idea, but there's a reason not everybody has one. Annoying as hell. That's the reason. Yeah. That's you, the only reason. <laughs> I have friends who still have sugar daddies, right? And they're like, oh, he made me so mad the other day. He said this and was really dismissive, and he said this, and then he said he was giving rid of my puppy, so he took my puppy away. And I was like... Did you break up with him? Like, that's rude. And sh they're like, no, then I wouldn't have the money anymore. And I'm like, I, like, can y'all imagine me, like, pretending to be polite and nice just so I could get money? That's not who I am. My sugar daddies always have to go away because I yell at them. We get in a fight. And they're like, I'm not spending money on you. <laughs> Can't yell at me and I spend money on you. I like you. how you say this. Like, this is just a common thing that everyone in the audience is going to be like, oh, yeah, sugar daddies. We all know how sugar daddies work. You I'm know, sorry that you, don't. you all know sugar daddy. <laughs> oh, yeah, just pay attention. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know how those sugar daddies work. That's just what happens with sugar daddies. You're naive if you don't know. <laughs> Fender uh, Sax Bay, thank you for just subscribing to Hyper RPG. Thank you for just subscribing. Um, so uh, there's still a lot of wrestling questions. Uh, Sarah, when you were writing, did you uh, work with more than one reviser or you felt you would be enough or maybe none? For Marvel, there were th a team of three editors. Um, and the draft was revised once by me, and then I think they revised it another time uh, for the final uh, printing. For the stuff that I work on on my own, I always go through at least one rewrite. And then I'll usually have another editor look at it as well. It's always great to have somebody else look over your work because you get you take things for granted a lot. That's what happened basically with the novel my cousin and I are writing. Um, we took it for for granted that this certain aspect of our world existed, and I went and reread through it, and I was like, you know, we actually we uh, we never made that. <laughs> so it's great to have somebody else look over. Um, what's your favorite story arc in wrestling, either current you or past? You just got called a sassy daddy, and I really want you to get that tattoo. <laughs> I'm going to get that tattoo right on my ass. Right on the butt. Sassy uh, daddy. My favorite arc right now in wrestling, mm, I don't technically have a favorite one right now, I'll be honest with you. I'd say one that I'm enjoying is um, the New Day against Rusev and Jinder, just because they're they're using a lot of comedy. And I, I really enjoy when you can blend good, solid wrestling with comedy. You got me. It's great. Uh, Cupcake Therapy wants to know if you have any experience with tabletop games, like role-playing games, mm -hmm. things like that. What, do you have any groups that you were part of? Or? Yeah, so I have two. Uh, oh, no, wait. Now I have three. I These have three. D&D groups? Yeah. Uh, They're all one's D &D? Dragon Age. Dragon Age? Yeah. We used to, so originally what happened was, uh, you know, working in Geek and Sundry, they, they had a room full of board games. 
And one day I got to go in there and pick anything I wanted as like a thank you for something. And it's like, otherwise it's going to get thrown away. So I picked Dragon Age, the tabletop RPG. I had it in my room for months. I had no idea how to play tabletop RPGs. No one I mm -hmm. ever knew growing up actually played D&D. I had only yeah, seen it on Futurama. That was like my, my experience with it. Uh, so I ended up uh, at a party with this girl who was showing off her new sugar daddy. And her new sugar daddy was this silver fox. And I could tell from the way he was looking at me that he wasn't as whipped as she thought he was, but that ended up coming up later. So anyway, I was like, yeah, I really want to play this game. I don't know how to play it. She goes, he's a DM. He's like, yeah, I'm a DM. I'll run it for you next week. So she comes over. He comes over. I gathered a couple other people, and we started. Uh, by the end, there were only two people left in that group because they broke up, and then, like, Leo and Ivan don't show up to nothing. Yeah, I'm going to call you out, Leo Camacho. And uh, we had to play a campaign made originally for five people with just two people oh, for like geez. three months. It took forever. That sucks. So anyway, I, I started new, I basically put out a call. I was like, anyone who's never played these games before, come play. And I think that's one of the reasons why my groups always end up being so diverse is because I, I think certain cultures don't really know about tabletop games as the same or European style board games. Like we played board games in my family all the time, but we played Monopoly. We played Uno. We played Scrabble. Um, nobody had like <laughs> whatever the like shadows over Camelot or anything. I didn't know anyone until after college even yeah. that played RPGs. Right. Nobody. Yeah, I didn't even run into anybody in college. Nobody. Um. So I I got another group together. We finished. We played Dragon Age. Had a great time. He moved us on to Monster of the Week, which is under like fantasy apocalypse. Oh, the apocalypse system. And then we moved on to D&D, &D, which was my first time playing D&D. &D. And then uh, I had another group of new people who wanted to play, so we started a new group with them. And then I missed Dragon Age, so I found another DM and made him run a Dragon Age group for me. What do you like about Dragon Age compared to D&D? &D? Because uh, I like the stunt points a lot, I guess. And I love the Dragon Age universe because I have such an attachment to it. You know, when someone says, oh, we're going to this city in D&D, &D, that, that means nothing to me. That, that name, you know, that culture, the people. Mm -hmm. I'm learning whatever the, D, the DM is saying. But when I'm playing Dragon Age, everything they say, I have, uh, like, a background for it. That's why I really like uh, the Valiant RPG that I GM, because it's, I like the comic book so much that just, I get to geek out. It's like, oh, we're doing this thing. Oh, and then we're doing the thing. Right. And it feels cool. It's neat. Right, it feels cool. When you're, you're more attached to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You're like, ah, oh, I'm in it. Don't ruin this for me. <laughs> Don't fucking ruin Don't this fucking for me. Don't ruin it. Yeah. Um, Board says, when I was first hired as a writer, it was for a big project and directly as a main writer back then, I felt really afraid and tough. These people are crazy. Did you have a similar experience when Marvel hired you? No, they were so hands off, to be honest. Um, it, the only thing that bothered me about that whole experience is they didn't like the word feminist to be written down in the book. Though everyone, including the people who wrote um, Peggy, would use the word feminist <laughs> when talking about it. Uh, so, like, that was the only time oh I ever God, had Oh, God, I like, can imagine in the interviews that coming up constantly. Like, because, I mean, that she is a yeah. strong woman. It's And the story itself is about being a strong woman and not being appreciated and it, about how there was, because of feminists, we now have a better situation than before. This is, like, a whole thing. Uh, and so not being able to say that, I kind of wanted to be like, you saw my website. You know where I came from. My website, by the way, was an all-female-run like gaming website. Uh, like, you know who I am. You've seen all my writing. Why would you hire me if I'm not allowed to say the word feminist? But then eventually, you have to humble yourself sometimes. Um, it wasn't about me, and it wasn't about my preference. It was about the story they were trying to tell. So when you're writing your own stories, yeah, sure, it's all about you. But if you're writing something for somebody else, if you're running social media for somebody else, if you're making a game for somebody else, it's not about you. <laughs> it's about the story that the team is trying to tell. So you get over it. Uh, Sarah, I know you mentioned some wrestling ladies that have inspired you. Are there any other people that have inspired you in your life? Those are great questions, Cupcake Therapy. Uh, this is going to sound so lame, but Frederick Douglass, let me explain. When I was a little Please kid, do. I discovered Frederick Douglass. Now, growing up, um, Frederick Douglass is basically listed in history books as black. And sometimes it'll say, uh, he claims that he was the son of his owner, so, you know, he was mixed. And he's always, and they would include his quote about his second wife being white. Oh, I honored my mother at my first marriage. I'm honoring my father at my second marriage. But, like, 
I had to do a bunch of research to find that. I stumbled upon it, and I was like, wait, he's, he's biracial like me. Somebody who's biracial like me, like, and he's in history, and he did cool stuff. And it meant so much to me that every project that I could, had to do about history, I always picked Frederick Douglass. So I know a lot about Frederick Douglass, oddly enough. Um, but it just inspired me that like this man did everything. Like he escaped from slavery, he learned how to read, he ended up being like an ambassador to Haiti. He was kind of a, a really great role model for a feisty child who's like, I want to do these things, and everyone's like, you can't do these things. Okay, here's a role model who did everything people said he couldn't do. So Frederick Douglass, um, and then Prince because he's so weird and quirky, and he was never ashamed to be weird and quirky. And I was always asked, why are you so weird? Why are you so weird? Sarah, can't you just fit in? Sarah, why do you do this? Nobody likes when people do this. Like, I was, I've been very aware my entire life that I don't fit in, and it's, I was always told, please fit in. And it makes sense, because we're social creatures, human beings. It helps the fabric of society. The more you can conform, the better everything's going to be. But I just couldn't ever do it. I would get beatings. I would get uh, like suspended. I would constantly lose out on opportunities. But I just couldn't bear not being myself. So Prince was a really great example for me, too. Um, growing up mixed, how did that affect your childhood? Like coming to Virginia as a mixed individual? Because Virginia, Virginia isn't necessarily... Capital of the Confederacy. Yeah, yeah But we're not right. the South. Uh, exactly. So, you know, how did you think that helped shape you, being a mixed-race individual? Well, so it's even more complicated than I think a lot of people outside of it think it is because colorism is actually a very big uh, thing in the black community as well. So I was getting it from all sides. Um, on the one hand, white people refused to try to understand what I was. So to white people, I was a Spanish chick. I was a dirty Mexican. I was an ugly Mexican. Um, to black people, I was, ooh, that cute light-skinned chick. Um, or, by certain people, I was uh, unknown. Why are you hanging out here? Why, are you, why do you think you're one of us? So there was a lot of not fitting in anywhere um, and, and not really being accepted by any sides. And, but I will say that the black community accepted me a lot more because black community has so many different parts of it. Uh, w whereas white people were like, oh, if you're anything not white, you are not white. Black people were more likely to say you are black and, and that sort of made a difference in my life. So I kind of grew up entrenched in what was called black culture, but really is just now popular culture pretty much, um, especially in Virginia. There's not as, m where I grew up in Virginia, because I'm not Northern Virginia, this is a big difference. Where I grew up in Virginia, everyone kind of has the same culture. Yes, there are the rednecks who are very anti-black over here. There are, um, you know, very proper people over here. But in the middle are people of every race who say y'all, who listen to rap music, who wear baggy pants. Like, we were all kind of together. So sometimes I, I would get accused of acting black when I, like, left that area of Virginia. And I was just like, this, this is how the white folk I know talk, too. <laughs> like, this isn't me acting anything. This is who I am. So I'm often... I think constantly not fitting in in both the ways, both socially and because of my race, made me feel even prouder of being like different, I guess. Um, like I used to write weird all over my notebooks and my mom would get mm -hmm. so mad. She's like, oh, stop it. Stop saying weird. You're not weird. You're not weird. But like I embraced the diversity. I love being able to tell people about Germany, about Puerto Rico, where my stepdad lived, because he did take me there one time. And then I had an embarrassing story about trying to speak Spanish, um, about St. Lucia, about black people to white people, about white people to black people. Like, being able to tell my friends, hey, you know the white person who flies that Confederate flag actually has no problem with you, but he thinks that, like, his grandfather died for that flag, so he still wants to hold it. And, like, you know, just, like, stuff like that. And I felt at the time that being mixed would be a way to heal racism, even. So I, I think it made me even more of a rebel <laughs> than I would have been otherwise, basically. Did you ever feel like in the workplace or, you know, getting to L.A. like you were at any sort of disadvantage? Yeah, L.A. was the hardest for me. Um, at the workplace, so it was, it was a few different things. On the one hand, there were a lot of positives because I don't look black. I don't look, you know, yes, I may not look all the way white. Now with my hair short, apparently I could have cut my hair a long time ago and just blended in with white people is what I'm being told now. But anyway, um, 
I was often treated differently than if a black person had done something. So I'm always loud and angry, but I've never been called by coworkers the loud, angry black woman stereotype. Uh, when the police used to stop me and my friends, if I said, I'm not with them, officer, they would let me go. Like, I had a lot of privilege from looking the way that I look. Um, and I didn't have as much of a problem finding jobs as my friends did. Uh, because, in part, the idea that, oh, you're a hot Spanish chick. Guys would say this. One time in physics class, this guy was like, what are you doing in here? And I was like, uh, taking physics. And he's like, oh, I thought you were just some hot Puerto Rican chick, but you're actually smart. And I was like, you can be both. Did you know that? So I think the, like, perceptions of what a Latina woman is helped me a lot in the workforce. Like, I got to get away with a lot of things. But coming out to LA, people knew what I was pretty easily. Like this was, and this was the first time in my life I would walk down the street and someone would go, "Are you part black?" And I was just like, "You knew, you knew what I was." It's, I'm like 26, and this has never happened to me before, and it happened to me a lot. Was on your mom or dad's side? My dad, um, and my mom is like super, super, super. She's whiter than you. She's the whitest creature you can imagine. Which is, well, I also think my dad ran out of like. Uh, coffee or whatever like because uh, my brother's really really dark skin and then we just get lighter and lighter and lighter and I'm the eighth child so I think he just like ran out of ink because uh, I came out this but I don't I don't look like anyone else in my family when I take pictures of my family people will be like oh you can mm -hmm. tell you have a different dad <laughs> so, thank you um, but out here people knew what I was uh, and that was exciting but it also made things uh, a little harder so because people people like to say things around you Actually, I have a story up on another site, too, where when someone doesn't know what you are, they default to something else, and then they'll say things around you, and then you're just like... If they're, if they're dicks. If they're dicks. And then you're like, do I speak up and say something and not get to hang out with these it, people in a mansion anymore? <laughs> or do I stay quiet and hate myself when I go home? So. Yeah, I, I hate being in those situations because mm -hmm. I'm the type of person that will say something. Um... But at the end of the day, I recognize that my privilege allows me to say something and I can stand up and be like, yo, that's not cool. Don't do that. Yeah. Which is easier for me now. Mm -hmm. I couldn't do that back home. Couldn't do that in northern Arkansas, southern Missouri. I just get beat up. Yeah. But it's like, no, you're the oddball here. Uh, here, it's like you call people out on that shit and it's like, oh, don't, don't. You're not going to tell someone I just did that, right? You're not going to tweet that I said that. You know, it's like there's this social kind of like, Oh, oh, I recognize that my attitude is not socially acceptable right. and that this is wrong, but I thought that we were cool here and we're like, no, we're not. Right. Back home, it's very much like, no, that's how it is. I was so shocked when I came out here um, and ran into racism. I know this yeah, is going to sound crazy. Yeah, it always, it always surprises me too because I'm just like, what the fuck? What do you have to what? be racist about? I'm, I'm from Virginia. I can go to the spot where Confederates burn this shit down. I can go to the spot where they used to roll slaves' dead bodies down at the end of the day when they didn't get sold. Like, there's reasons for the, the racial confusion and difficulty and, and everything that goes on here. And you come to Cali, you're like, you were like founded by a bunch of people of different races. Where is your racism well, coming from? Well, I think it's, it's, it's different. It's it is. It's a different race. People wear the racism on their sleeve mm -hmm. in the South and, and stuff like that. And I, and I found... I kind of prefer it. Is we, that weird? Well, yeah. <laughs> and I, I talked to a few about that once, too. And it's just like, yeah, you can, you can smell the bullshit. You know, like right. you can see it. You can see it coming. So you know, like, what's up? Right. Uh, here, it's very secretive. Yeah, I call and it... And it's more like, it's like behind closed doors, keeping you from jobs, putting you down kind of thing, which is... I don't know. It is I even, it's weird. Yeah, I called it something else when I moved out here when I was like trying to explain it. I was like, this is like casual racism. And it, it really does bother me more because like I said, if I can see the pattern that led to your beliefs, I can have a little more compassion and empathy for you and try to find a way to work through it. We actually, I just, we helped a lot of people not be racist back home. My, mixed, my very mixed family, because my sister married a black man. Most of my family I grew up with was black. And then my mom was dating a redneck. And so we were getting the rednecks and the black people together all the time. And the rednecks were going, oh, black people, pretty fun. Black people always knew rednecks can get down on some beer. And we were, like, healing. But out here, if, if you don't know. It's always been one of my favorite aspects of growing up 
surrounded by nothing but rednecks and then living in the ghetto of Kansas City and being like, this is the same it's thing. It's the same. Poor you're, people you're are You're mad insane. at the wrong people. <laughs> yes. Mad at the government, not Absolutely. each other, yes. please. Yes. <laughs> you're being held down by the same people. Yes. You're so similar. Yes. It's but so then the, they're so similar, but at the same time, the second you try to explain to the white rednecks that they still have privileges that black people don't, like, oh, fuck, that's a never. You're right. never going to convince them of that. They're convinced that it, their life is just as hard. And it's like, well, no, it's hard, but you still have right. an advantage. Right. You have to understand yeah. that. Nuh-uh, nuh-uh. No. It's like, what? Well, fuck, I can't win this battle. I usually just leave it alone at that yeah, point. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, listen, I'm just happy we got to Yeah, this right, we got this far. We're good. We're gonna just leave We're it good. Just, just, just understand you guys are mad at the wrong people. You're like... It blows my mind how easy it is to trick poor people into being mad at each other instead yeah. of the people who put them in that situation. Yeah, to trick poor people into fucking my mom's, supporting... Ah, I just can't, I'll never understand it. My mom's redneck boyfriend, who has been, has been dating her since I was seven, I would call him my stepdad, but we, we butted heads a little too much on certain things. For example, you know, racism. Call Michelle Obama a bitch once in front of me, and I was like, never again. We will never be on, we'll never be on friendly terms again, because she ain't do nothing but tell you to eat turnips. Okay, anyway. Um, but his daughter has cancer, and she's, she's dying. Uh, and the process of trying to get help for her, to get medical help, to get you know, her help with insurance and all these things, I would think that that would have helped him understand a little more about what, why people are socialists, for example, you know, instead of having to fight this fight on your own. I mean, she lives in a trailer park. She's got another daughter. She's got yeah. two granddaughters. Like, you can't afford to do this. You need help. And even going through that, it, the, the racism and his long-held beliefs that it's not, it's not something that, that, um, is caused by the, the society. It's something that he just didn't work hard enough or he just wasn't smart enough. And, and this belief that it's still something that could be fixed by <laughs> certain kinds of people is just yeah. mind-blowing to me. No, I know. I, I, it's the, the most frustrating aspect of... Well, I mean, it's happening now. It's happening. You see people in all these town, hall, town halls freaking out because they're like, oh, that Affordable Care Act was actually quite nice. I, it would cost us money, but I benefited from it. I can't get coverage. Like, I have a pre-existing condition. Yeah. Like, the Affordable Care Act actually finally gave me a, a billion. Like, a lot of people in our chat room I know. Because we have a lot of yeah. people who are have that kind of... Uh, we have a lot of health issues in our chat room. Um, and a lot of people get helped by that. And it always blows my mind to see people, like, fighting against the stuff that that helps them. And, yeah. when, and seeing people so easily sold mm -hmm. on things that they don't understand. Things we don't understand has always driven our cultures. Right. From the beginning of time, if we don't understand something, we, don't, we can't admit that we don't get it. We make something up. Right. If it's over our heads. Oh, the sun's rising. How does the sun work? Fuck it, it's a sun god. To be fair, it's confusing. It's a sun god. <laughs> that, 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 there's a fucking giant guy over there, and he's lifting it up every fucking day. I can't walk that far. I can't get to it. But it's obviously a dude. Obviously. It's obviously a dude. See, have you looked at the stars? I would believe in gods too. I'd be like, Look, I, I see a face up there. There's, <laughs> there's, a, there's a bull up there. He's hiding in the sky. I see it. You can't tell me it's not there. And if we don't get it, we make something up. So there's the country is run by such complex things that if you don't get it, you believe the most easy to understand thing and you call it reasonable because you understand it having the ability to admit you're not smart enough you'd have to be smart enough to admit right. that you have to be smart enough to admit Why you're not smart enough that he's not wise right and you have so many things it's just like you hear something and you go oh yeah that's totally it oh the government subsidizing anything that has to do with me like that's socialism fuck that it's like Dude, you drive on highways, you right. listen to the radio, you, you watch want TV. Bridge you want to be fixed. <laughs> like, it, the fucking internet, the dude. Internet? The yeah. fucking internet. It was funny. Um, the, the internet is like the best example in this country of everyone coming together for something. And mass information is spread in a way like us even being able to do this in its sense is it's like it's a subsidized thing that, that it all comes together to just piss things away because someone convinced you because you don't get it 
that it's I mean whatever I'm preaching to the choir everybody here gets this shit it's just it's just annoying so it was Fucking funny annoying. I will share one more story about Obamacare uh, I had milk affordable care act we got to stop calling it Obamacare I want to tell you why I called it Obamacare God damn it uh, so I had health insurance under the military stuff uh, until college until actually until I was 21. Now, Obama put something into law that said that military kids, uh, sorry, that said that everyone can still be under insurance until they graduate college. However, military had a loophole in that. If you didn't have an ID card, you could not have military insurance. And I was not allowed to get my ID card renewed past the age of 21 unless I joined the military. I think they eventually closed that loophole, but at the time that I had it, they didn't close it. So I didn't have insurance for like five years, came out here, um, heard, you know, oh, you can sign up, you just sign up for, you know, Obamacare, Obamacare, and I'm like, I don't know what that is. I go and I signed up for insurance, okay? I called up all these different places that said that they took my kind of insurance. I said what it was called. I can't remember. It's called, it was called like something like, let's say it was TRICARE. I know it's not. Like TRICARE uh, Elvin. We'll make it Sarah, up. it's TRICARE. That's what Gundam X saying. <laughs> and I would say that to people and they say, oh, we don't take Obamacare. And I'd be like, I don't have insurance called Obamacare. I have insurance called blah, blah, blah. And on this website, it says that you take it. They'd be like, no, no, we don't take Obamacare. I called six different places up, and they all said that exact same thing to me. And I was just like, I, that's part of why people call it Obamacare, because that's all anyone calls it, because it's easier to understand. It's a yeah. very simple thing. So, But it's not simple. It's not. Healthcare is not simple. Eventually I got better healthcare, y'all, but it went away again when I got laid off. <laughs> yeah. But. Yeah, we, uh, yeah. It's not cheap. Yeah, I mean, I, I know it's not cheap, but it, it's, it's important. Um, I know that's what I kept saying to them. I was like, "That's not a. Th I, there's no insurance called Obamacare. <laughs> I, I'm college educated. Damn it! I really hate that. I, I mean, I honestly like feel like that was a huge misstep of Obama and the Democratic Party was to allow people to call it Obamacare. And I know it feels good to have your name on something, but it really fucks things up whenever we're such a partisan what country. What do I hate, Obama? So what else do I hate? Obamacare. Obamacare instead of <laughs> the Affordable Care Act. Like, it was kind of, a, it was a pretty stupid move. My mom once got an argument, because living with a redneck man has turned her racist slowly over the years, um, which is hilarious because none of her children are white. Um, but my, my relatives came over from England, and my great aunt, who's like beyond 80, I don't know, she old as heck, got, got the stuff where she can't see, can barely walk, all that stuff. Oof. Real old. She originally came from Ireland. She's been living in Connecticut. So this conversation came up while we were all sitting there. My mom's like furious. She's like, you know, black people are abusing the system, blah, 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 blah. And I was about to get up and leave the room because I was going to scream at this chick. And then to my utter surprise, my English relatives and my incredibly old auntie from Ireland snapped on her and they were like actually this is how healthcare works where we're from and blah 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 and just like went off and were like it doesn't matter what color Obama is and I was just like that was so crazy to me because I where I grew up if you were an older white person you were definitely a little racist unless you know you had your black grandkids and then you were only a little racist like my mom um, but just hearing that people from countries where they did have health care that works uh, didn't feel, it felt like we had done all this stuff to purposefully fuck it up and that it works just fine. And getting to watch my mom get schooled by them instead of the young, rebellious one she doesn't ever have to listen to. Yeah. So nice. I stayed in the room. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it took a long time to convince my father, especially, that the affordable character is a good thing. And it's just like, and it's just, I used to get so mad at him too because he buys into the whole thing. Like, he works in a factory in Arkansas, it's all he's surrounded with. You start believing the hype, but then it's like, look look in front of you. I, your son, can't get health care. Right. You had to sue an intro. Lucas broke his back when he was like 16. Oh, jeez. And they fought the insurance company for years in court. They did finally win, and Lucas got a fairly large payout. Like, the vehicle he drives is from his insurance, like that settlement from uh, the lawsuit, because they fucked us. Right. Like, they wouldn't cover his surgeries and everything after they said that they would, you know? And it's just like, we've dealt with this bullshit system our whole lives, and you don't support... You make the Mexicans? Yeah! Like, <laughs> I'm like, you have first-hand experience with how fucked up this is, and how terrible this is. Like, when my insurance... Like, we spent years trying to find out what my condition was. Years. 
the, when we found out it was a curse, it wasn't a blessing. I thought it was going to be a good thing because we've been spending years trying to figure out what was wrong with me. We find out, geneticist says it's precondition, a pre-existing condition that traced down through my mom's genetics. Boom, insurance company dropped us in the middle of all these things and we had thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars worth of physical therapy bills that my parents and I could not afford. Right. Luckily for us, the physical therapist that I had had been working with me for so long and was very sympathetic to my situation said, this is on us, your insurance company is a piece of shit. Right. And they, they, they absorbed that cost. Nicest, one of the nicest things anyone's ever done for us as a family. And, but it, the fact that we've been through all that shit and we still had to constantly be like, please, why do you think all of the, like, stop believing partisan bullshit. Even right. if there's things that are, I feel like we have to get to a point in a country where we can say, I think there's things wrong with this, but we have to take steps forward. Right. And allow, like to take steps forward, we have to be fixing things as we go. It's like, and I feel like everyone wants to sing now where it's like either 100% good or 100% bad. And I hate that. It's like, it's that partisan mindset. It's like, or fix a couple things, keep fixing the thing, call out the things that are bad, admit that those things are bad, and let's keep fixing, and let's keep fixing, and let's keep fixing. Yeah. But it's just instead, it's either fuck it or it's great. Fuck it or great. Mm. Yeah. It, it's, you know, I used to, growing up, you know, you know Republicans, you know Democrats, you know conservatives, you know liberals. I've always believed that people had the right to believe what they want because this is America. You know, oh, you know, this person believes that financially it's better for small businesses to do this and this. I believe financially it's better for this. It's fine. We're both humans. We love each other. And somehow over the years, it's just gone so far that it's like, wow, like I literally can't even comprehend that you can look that person in the face, hear their words and say you still agree with them 100%. Is it really impossible for you to say, I agree with these two things and I disagree with these right. other three things? Right, right. And it is now. No one- You're not allowed no to do that anymore. It. <laughs> for, yeah, apparently actual like civil discourse is not allowed anymore. Not allowed. I like disagreeing with things and people. I believe small businesses should blah, blah, blah. And also black people and Mexicans are ruining everything. Wait, could you, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even think those have to go together. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, it's weird. Everything's extremist now, and I, that's the stuff that scares me because I do believe like the pendulum swinging thing. And what scares me is like the pendulum's been split to like partisan, partisan. It's just like swinging to these crazy extremes. It's, God damn it! it just it's, can we have logical discussions, <laughs> please? And I'm just so worried now because I guess because I read a lot of fantasy books. Mm. Uh, yeah, and I'm sci-fi, so it's right. all like. Yeah we're, yeah, we're headed to shit. Yeah, we're headed to shit, and the way this works is that it doesn't get better. The only way it gets better is if the um, everything is destroyed. I don't agree with that. And a new civilization comes I think up. that's how we imagine is the only way for things to get better. Now, that being said, I also, as a realist, understand that every dynasty has fallen. Every civilization that's has fallen. That's what I'm saying. I've seen this cycle happen. There's a cycle. There is a cycle. But we have things now that we've never had in the history of the Earth before. So we're a special case. Um, the whole earth right now is a special case. That's true. For better or worse, in itself it has become extremist. We are a globalized world now. It used to be a civilization doesn't even know about another fucking civilization on the other side of the planet. They don't even know it fucking exists. Right. They're just doing their thing for 600 years or more. Don't even fucking know. Now everything's in media and we have this access to technology and advancements so fast and it's happening so quick i even as a realist still like to think that things can get better before they get worse because we can see them well part of my problem we is we can see them we say that right we're like oh we have more information than ever before we yeah. can see that these things have happened we can try to prevent them unfortunately we've literally at least four times in the past year seen the thing, had people who studied it say, hey, don't do this thing because of this thing in the past, and then done it anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my concern is twofold. On the one hand, I think people aren't actually learning from the past, period. I think people do what they want, what makes them happy right now in the moment, they're going to do it. And What benefits two, them in that moment. Right. You know? And number two, I think that, unfortunately, we've been kind of shown an ugly truth that you can push things way further than we ever believed you could as far as diplomacy and politics. Oh my God, that's what's been so interesting about the last couple months is finding out how many things weren't actually laws, but just, just things that you did. commonplace. Right. Things that they're just like, well, these are just traditions. Tradition. And that a lot yeah. of our democracy is actually held up 
more by traditions yes. than laws. And I actually, living in like, Virginia, oh, learned a lot of that. Like, there were things our teachers would point out to us. Like, oh, do you notice after the election, presidents don't shit talk past presidents anymore? It's because blah, blah. So my concern is now that we've seen how far we can go, I mean, we can literally be like, I'm the president of America, fuck you, China. Will anyone be willing to put those traditions back up and go back to pretending like we have to follow these rules if we've just shown that you don't have to follow the rules? That's what yeah, I'm Yeah, I mean, the things I'm talking about, let's adapt. There are laws that are being broken and ignored. I understand that. But there's other stuff, too, where it's like certain things that you just think are part of what comes with the package that you find out okay. were just traditions. They were just common courtesies right. that had been passed down, like the First Lady instances and, you know, living in the White House and mm-hmm. being a spokesperson on this kind of stuff. It's like, oh, wait, they don't have to? She can literally live somewhere else and we pay for it? I, I didn't know that. Nobody did. It's like, oh, I guess we're just looking for loopholes now. We're literally right. just looking for loopholes. How much time do you have to fill positions? There are 500-something positions still unfilled. <laughs> something yeah. that no one else ever thought everyone else do. is just like we should probably do this fast because the country's at stake right. <laughs> so you know not to get it's interesting it's interesting it's interesting it, and i mean everyone's always said throughout history democracy super fragile democracy yeah. super fragile democracy and when you read that stuff in history books as americans we're fairly short-sighted because we're a young country and we've known we're young but at the same time our history as we know it has been pretty positive we had the fucked up shit happen in world war ii and stuff like that but most of it happened off country right you know and and we had fights internally right like civil rights and things like that but as a democracy it's compared to most countries we're like oh we're great right oh we're great so we never really believe it when our history teachers tell us democracy is really fragile everyone when they signed the constitution said that ultimately Freedom, you know, all these things need to be in place because democracy is fragile and it requires the public to be educated and all these things and, and that they don't even think it'll work. Even the founding fathers don't think that this will work. And you're just like, oh, whatever, Psh, come it's on, fine. whatever. Fine. It's fine. It's out of sight, out of mind. That's the craziest part to me is because as Americans, we do get to live with this sense of ignorance. Mm-hmm. We just get to live. We do. And that's something a lot of countries, I learned that a lot going, like traveling to third world countries that like, oh, oh, now I get it. Yeah. The we first, just get to fucking live. Yeah. We have, we have so much. So again, as a fantasy like reader, I, I also love history. So I read about these cultures where they got to that point where we're kind of at now, except without all of the technology where they had a lot of free time. And usually that's when things go bad. But you go to a third world country and you're like, cool, where's your bathroom? It's like, oh, if the, ba- the bathrooms... Uh, there's like a public bathroom area. You got to pay to use it. Uh, you go down this hill and you go up this way. But if you want, I can like bring up water from the well if you like, you know, want to take a bath in the morning and not have to go down. Like, where's your light switch? Oh, I don't have electricity. It's just like so many things you just take for granted as why we can live. The but way even we from live. a government standpoint, like dealing with uh, when I was working with charities in other co- in other countries, and you, you, something as simple as just getting a fucking package delivered. Is yeah. impossible. Yes. It's impossible. Yes. <laughs> uh, there is no infrastructure and the government doesn't care and you want to send something into that country? Oh, if it's valuable. No, you don't. So Someone in that customs office is going to keep it. And there isn't a system in place to keep them to not. And you realize like, oh, like so much of what we have is based on the decency of wanting to keep it together. Mm-hmm. It's wanting it to work to make it work because you could just not want it to work you could just be like you know what fuck the system i don't have to and then i understand when you're younger you're just like yeah fuck this system and then as you go you're like oh shit wait i've been to places where there is no system and that sucks (laughs) that sucks seeing kids starving on the street which it happens here i get it can always be better it can always always be better just we lack perspective i got to grow up lacking perspective even though it's surrounded by a lot of poverty and a lot of rednecks and, and things like that we still have a lot of things that we just get to we get to live that's what i'm saying i grew up we about poor. getting bombed right but exactly i grew up being poor but i did not know what poor was until i went somewhere else like we i was always on free lunch and then they uh, virginia changed the rules so that uh, i was suddenly on reduced lunch 
My mom could not afford it. So every week at work, she would beg her other coworkers for quarters until she had enough quarters to pay for my lunch for the week. And that's actually how she ended up getting a boyfriend because he was like, look at this hardworking, industrious woman that's got to beg for quarters. And he decided that that was going to be his boo. But anyway, like... I thought I grew up poor, but nope, my friends, sometimes the water trucks don't come and they don't get to have water. <laughs> like, fuck. It's, it's, it's something you can't really understand until you see it. But that's also why I worry about us learning from the past because I really do think you don't learn things until you experience them. No, and I know. We've been very fortunate. That's what I mean. Yes, we are one of the longest running successful democracies. That's what I mean. We've gotten, when people are like, oh, civil war, and I'm like, yeah, but that's abstract to us. Right. That is abstract to all of us. All of these things are abstract because, as we know, if you don't see it yourself, you don't believe it to exist. And we're cut off from most of the world. Yes, we're globalized, but it's not at our door. Not like in Europe where literally there's the next country day. over, there's shit happening. And you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, we don't want that to happen. You know, or in, in other countries too, it's more prevalent. To us, it always feels out of sight, out of mind. Right. That's the rest of the world. We don't have to deal with that here. We don't, we're America. We There's an America. idea. And part of it's the way the rest of the world sees us. Even when they don't like us, they adore us. Our media gets soaked up everywhere. You go anywhere in the fucking world, you're going to know certain American celebrities. There's just, there's this, it gets in our heads very easily. It's easy to understand. And, and what I mean when it's out of sight of mind, it's like, I needed to go to third world countries to grow as an individual. It had and needed to happen. I think all Americans should I to get perspective. Agree. For should, fuck's yeah. sake, we need perspective. Because I was so not with perspective. You see things on TV, you read about it, you talk to other people about it, but you still just don't understand what it means to be able to survive in a way, even when you're poor. Like, I was homeless for a while, but I still, again, didn't have to worry about things that are like second nature to worry about in some of the third world countries I travel to where it's just like, oh no, 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 no. Right. Like, no, you just, and they still find joy in living. That's what's amazing about human life too. That's the other perspective that's really important is even when you think shit's really, really bad, then you go other places and go, oh fuck, they have it way worse. There's still a lot of laughter. There's a lot of joy. Right. There's a lot of happiness. Uh, through all of that, and that's important too. Right. But I it, think even people visiting well-off countries as Americans is still even useful because when you go somewhere else and you have to look back at America, we're constantly raised, t being told America is great. America is the greatest country in the world. And then you go to Germany, and it's like, oh, American school systems are so bad that my sisters came to America and graduated two years ahead, and students who have to come to Germany from America are like, three years behind, <laughs> it's like, when you start to interact with other people and you realize, wow, this person speaks three languages, this person speaks two languages, this person also speaks three languages, it, I think anywhere you go outside of America can help you understand that your viewpoint is skewed, and that's the first step to overcoming a bunch of other things. So. Yeah. Somebody says, thoughts on moral relativism? And I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> Let's get, no, I don't know if we can get into that. I am I mean, related I, to lots of people with good morals. <laughs> I think they're very important. <laughs> Honestly, this chat room wouldn't work without it. Oh, yeah, about Germany being cheaper. I held a big grudge against my mom for years for taking me out of Germany because if I'd still been in Germany, I would have had a better education. I would speak at least two languages, and I would have gone to college for <laughs> very, very cheap. Instead, I had to work really, really, really hard to get to college and to pay for it. Uh, my t my other siblings all went to the military to pay for college. My mom was like, there's no way I'm paying for college for you. You got to join the military like your siblings. And I was like, F that. So if I'd been in Germany, it would have been perfectly fine and easy to just go to college like my brother and sister in Germany did. But no, America was the land of opportunity. So she went there when she had her freedom from marriage. And it's like, this was a lie. You came here to work as a hostess? <laughs> in a restaurant with your three kids and one grandchild. Like, we were crazy poor. Anyway. Yeah, I do understand the people, somebody was saying, like, the people who need to travel can't afford it. They can't afford and it. And I get that. I couldn't either when mm -hmm. I was younger. It took a long time to get there. And, that and that's why we need more of this socialist bullshit, because then you have programs that actually help pay for you to go take trips places. Yeah, but we're a very nationalist country. Um, which, I mean, I, I get the benefits, too. I mean, it's one of those things I say. Not everything's black and white. Yep. I'm not going to sit here and just shit on it. I'm saying we're a very privileged country. We have things pretty damn good. 
even the things that are bad. Our healthcare needs a lot of work. There's other things that need a lot of work. A lot of government stuff needs a lot of work, but we have shit really fucking good. Uh, we're able to sit here and bitch about it live on the internet to people all over the world. In and my not Pusheen sweater, which costs not, like a lot. <laughs> and not have to worry about the repercussions for doing so. And I think that's important as it stands. But that in and of itself is one of the reasons that we, are, we live in an interesting country and, and why I don't think we've been challenged. And sometimes you see other countries, especially like a couple years ago when, when we didn't, like the women's march was amazing. Yeah, that was crazy. Doesn't fucking matter your pol- your political standpoint. That many people in the country coming together to stand up for what they believe in is powerful. I believe, and it. you see it happen in other countries. Right, I think because it was twenty percent of the people in LA, by the way, yeah. showed. Like, can you imagine twenty percent of LA gathered in one place? Because you see that in a lot of European countries, they've had a more a more relevant history of having to fight for the democracy. And I always used to theorize, like, man, what would happen in America? Do I think people would actually stand up, and they did. And you're like, oh shit, no, this is refreshing. This is good to know. Because it lets you know that like you can spout this bullshit and everything. If it ever does get to a point where they're like, no, we're taking away your right to get on the internet and say whatever you want about your government like other countries. I was like, no, nah, I don't think that would fly here. Yeah. I don't think, I don't, I, I think we've had freedom for too long. We've had this comfortability for too long. There's, I don't think that I don't think you could do that. I think that we as a country are too strong for you to get away with that. And here's Pessimist Sarah to say, if you put a frog in water and you turn it up slowly, he will not notice he's being boiled to death. Meaning, I worry that they will take away freedom so small that you don't notice until suddenly we are the frog in the pot. I don't know if that's true. I watched I, it on. I, 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 under, I understand Volcano. what you're saying. I understand what you're saying. Uh, I think with the globalized communication and the generation of young people on the internet good fucking luck right because because they're China smarter than you that, and china would have been at least two generations raised you've given us this freedom sort of for so long yeah. uh yes we are already losing some freedoms but there's some big ones like yeah you go gotta, ahead take the freedom Oklahoma, of speech on the internet you out you gotta go right to somebody and be like can i have your written permission that i can uh get rid of this fetus like yeah we're definitely losing stuff yeah we've lost some stuff happening. we have lost some stuff it's uh terrifying. I'm and then we gain some stuff and then we lose some stuff and then we gain some stuff and we lose some stuff thank you bipartisanship it's great um and even then i don't know if it's bipartisanship it's, it feels yeah there's a lot of stuff there i mean i mean again sometimes you always i get back to like the overall like ecological stuff, the psychological stuff, the sociological stuff, like as a country, are we too big? Will we ever be one unified country when we're this large? Because we will never have the ability to actually come together as a country right. with this many different ideals in place. But then other people say it's these different ideals that make this country so unique and so interesting, even when we fight, even when we argue, even when we disagree on all these things, it's an ability that a lot of other countries don't have. Because even though we have a long way to go when it comes to racism and all these other things, there are a lot of other highly advanced countries in the world not nearly as diverse as this country. I mean, we, we forget that sometimes. We, are, we have a long way to go. We have a lot of fucking work to do. Um, but, you know, you, you go to certain other countries like Japan and, and you, you, you look around and you're like, oh, we, we, we've... We're there's a lot of shit that we do have that they they don't. Right. Um, they may not be as hard on the people who don't have what they have, uh, but this this there's a lot of other con- people in this country giving very extreme representations of their cultures, especially in LA. Like you can't escape yeah. it. I love LA for I, that. I do too. I've always you know I feel like this is the safest place to be if you're somebody who likes diversity. Yeah. And, and like likes all the nice things. When I first moved Malik here... Malik and I didn't like Seattle because of that. Yeah. And and people will tell me, like, Seattle's really diverse, especially the area we're in and all this kind of stuff. I'm like, yeah, 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 fine. You don't feel it. Yeah. You don't feel it. Yeah. But, You're like, f- everything coming together in one place. Yeah. It, it's very interesting. I, I do love that feeling here. I love that I can always try something new or learn something new here. Um we used to have a multicultural festival back in college, like every year. I was the marketing co-chair, by the way. Um, but like, it feels like I'm constantly experiencing that festival 
while I'm in LA, except for yeah. Caribbean people. There's there's so few Caribbean people that a Jamaican lady gave me her hand and told me to call if I need everything. And if you're Caribbean, <laughs> like that is a thing that Jamaicans do not do for other Caribbean people. So I was like, oh no, there's no Caribbean yeah, people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean it's and, and there's certain cultures that aren't represented in LA very well. But what I like about it is, and I, and we were talking about this the other day when we were driving around, even in this area. What's unique about it is most cities feel like you know like seattle portland like that's the pacific northwest mm -hmm. it's 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 it has a feeling to it that you're like it feels like the pacific northwest la can only be described as la because it is so uniquely hodgepodge together it has no it has no style it has no architecture or feeling because it's fucking everything just yeah. slammed together and like people felt like doing it that time <laughs> yeah mostly hispanic in that sense, like most of the architecture and most of the things, but even that is so hodgepodge together that you're just, it's just, <laughs> here's everything. It's one of the few places I've been where people will actually describe things by architecture and periods and stuff like that, uh, because I don't know, I, I lived in places where things were kind of built at the same time. For example, Hampton, Virginia was completely burned down uh, during the, the, which war was it? I think it was the Civil War, yeah. All that was left was like one church. Oh wow, Kinky Mouse says they live in a place where they have 177 nationalities and 300,000 300, citizen town. That's amazing. Crazy. It's really interesting. Uh, but like people, you tend I had to, to like disagree to a degree, things. Zach? I don't know, Alwyn. Like when I, every time I go out of LA and I come back, I immediately feel like comforted by how just, Fucking weird and crazy it all is. Yeah, that's what I had to tell my, my mom's different. boyfriend. He, like I said, he's a redneck. So he's always saying stuff like, oh, well, you know, you liberals want to take something and ruin it. Or if you had your way, you'd have this or you'd have that. And I really want to be like, please come to L.A. Like, I want you to feel how comfortable and happy I am in this place and see that actually all those things you think are negatives lead to us having a pretty good time. Like, I know not to eat there at this McDonald's because I'm going to get the cancers. It's nice that there's a sign there. I'm still gonna eat there, but hey, someone cared. The unemployment system here is so good. They're like, all right, girl, you wanna take some classes? You wanna learn how to be better at what you do? Let's look at your resume. Like, everything's so nice here, I love it. Except, I don't love no, that and, we have and, a river we've trapped and, in cement. Ozai, I would like to talk about Ozai that. 75, I do see your comments in the chat room. I just don't feel like diving that deep into current political stuff. I'm, I'm cool with talking about us as a culture, and stuff like that. I just don't want to talk about direct, exact things that are happening today in the government. I, I don't want to go. I don't want to go there. I don't personally know about the disability system, and I'll let you talk more to that if you want to. But I I'm, don't because okay. I avoid it because I'm an a, I'm <laughs> an idiot. That's right because you say you don't want to. Do I'm it. a fucking idiot. So I I'm, wish I knew more about it. Sometimes, like now, I'm fucking right now, I should, but I don't. I. I, I ignore it. I, I don't know necessarily about the system, but I know about the uh, attempts to make things accessible for all sorts of people, and that has been kind of eye-opening for me, especially once I got my injury to my back and I couldn't move, and I realized, oh, here's all the things that you can't do if you don't have a full range of motion that, again, just like we were saying with politics and with everything else, sometimes when you don't experience things, you don't really get it. Um, the justice system is like that too, by the way. But anyway, um, oh, did I tell you I've been arrested before? Anywho, um, so I, I, I was profiled. I, I was profiled once. Well, you look like all handcuffed. the other, all the other white, all the other white dudes. <laughs> no, this was back when I was in my goth kind of phase. I was a, I was a skater, <laughs> and I was traveling through Do you have a small. Pictures of you as a goth. Nope, Facebook wasn't around, dude. I was a I'm too old for that. Like the the periods where I went through that stuff, I was like, oh man, yeah. There's like no record of that stuff. I was, that's like a couple years that are just off the public record. There's no. I was homeless. I was like skating. And you were a homeless skating goth. Yeah. See, I was one of only two. Goths Traveling in my to a school. couple different like skate parks in southern Missouri, and you know, because I looked different, I got arrested. <laughs> well, yeah. It's funny. Well, you know, you were goth, clearly you're up to no good. I was one of only two goths in my school, so everyone used to say, did you get your black lipstick by making out with Rachel? No, we each have our own black lipstick. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't uh, actually have that many black clothes though, so I was usually goth once a week, <laughs> like full goth. I was normal goth every other day. 
And then I found out I could always tell other people were goth, so you really surprised me because I had no, no sense of gothy. Oh, but it was, it was Southern Missouri version. It probably Maybe it was different. not even close <laughs> to whatever. Not like the Virginia goth. No, whatever, you know. I, I didn't have access to other people to base these things on. Uh, it was Did just you date me girls who wore like ties, kind of like. No, there were no girls that were. <laughs> there were no girls. That were into the thing. It was mainly me and my friend at the time finding out there was a mall a couple hours away mm -hmm. in Springfield, Missouri that had a hot topic. And we were like, this is different. This is different. We're skating and being all different and shit. Right. We'll Going wear here. these clothes. We'll wear this. Kind of in a hodgepodge way. I still had cargo shorts that were cut off mm. and you know, rope you made sandals. An mm. I still. I wanted the big yeah. pants really bad, the, the really big legged pants, and my mom would never let me get them. But they were the thing I dreamed of, and now they're the thing that gets made fun of all the time. And I'm I'm still got a little piece of me that wants really big pants, <laughs> the only thing I never got as a child. How dare you make fun of it? On a pilgrimage to Hot Topic. I remember there was a time in college where it was like the coolest thing in the world was getting a duster. Like a leather jacket duster. Everybody had the... Well, I mean, Matrix came right, out. Right, right. Uh, we called those going to shoot up the school things because that was our fear. Cool. Um, well, we did just lose our chat yeah, room. Yeah, so don't say anything important for a well, few minutes. Well, we, we just lost our chat room, which usually means... Oh, it's time to that go. It's, it's Is that time. how you tell me to leave? You're like, bye chat. It's, oh, look, the chat broke. Sarah, you got to go. It's pretty much time to uh, to, to start calling it a day. Uh, oh, that noise. Oh. <laughs> to say goodbye. Uh, I'm going to pull the chat, chat up right here. Buddies. Oh, um. Zai, Zen State, <laughs> and Light. I can't remember another one that will rhyme with. Okay, there we go. We got we got the chat room pulled back up so we can at least say goodbye to everybody. It is past 12, and uh, I'm going to take a bath before I go to bed and relax. Yeah, I'm going to be at that bus stop he told you the address of already. <laughs> You're not walking to that bus stop. It's too far away. I don't know, maybe. Go look for it, that one. Wait outside in the cold. I dare you. It'll be fun. Do it. Um... Yeah, you know, well, Sarah, thank you for coming by and talking. I know there's a lot more. Every time I do, I was like, I have very interesting friends. You're one of those very interesting friends. Oh, shucks. And a couple hour conversation is never enough to crack the surface of an interesting person. I'm like an egg. Yeah, there's a lot going on in there. Um, <laughs> there's a lot going on in there. A lot there. going on in there. So, you know, if you guys want to continue the conversation with Sarah, you know where to find her online. Also, all those wrestling questions that he ignored, please uh, ask those during Ready to Ramble. Please do. Saturdays. 6.30. You should be here for that. It's you actually really fun. You guys are a fun group to listen talk. And you have a guest this week. Yes, we have Kyle. I've never said his last name out loud. Hebert? Hebert? I Herbert. don't know. He's the voice of adult Gohan. We had him on a couple of weeks ago. I should know how to say his last name. I've never I've never said it. It's the problem of a geek. Read everything. Um, but he's a big fan and he does a lot in the anime world. So we're really excited to have him. And he actually came up with the name Ready to Ramble, which we all forgot to say last time. He was the one who came up with the name? Yeah. yeah. I know. <laughs> Why didn't we take advantage of that? How did I not know he was the one that did? I'm sure somebody told me and I just went right over my head. I'd always, uh, I'm oh, losing wow. my mind. There was at some point today where Emily asked me something and I was like, no, why would you do that? Just go ahead and release the thing. If we have that, release just go content. ahead and do it. And she was like, you told me not to. And I was like, no, I did not. Wait. <laughs> yeah, maybe I did. Did I? <laughs> did I actually say that? Am I losing my mind? She's like, only a little bit. I'm like, Well, Fuck. it makes sense. You're, do you're doing a lot. I'm no. losing it. I'm actually losing it. I'm, Just I'm there. Just write everything down in post-it notes. Put them all on your wall and maybe print out a few pictures I did of that. random women. I did that last year for a little bit. I went through a phase of that. <laughs> Two days later, I'm like, what the fuck does any of this mean? <laughs> I don't, I don't know. know. Grab a fish. What was I talking I about? I email myself now. I have two yeah. different email accounts, so I'll email myself to the other email account as a priority email. Yes, I do that as well. Be like, don't do it. Forget the, the thing. Yep. Uh, so yeah, um, so many color notes in my phone. Just email. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Uh, thank you guys for subscribing and following. I saw we got a couple subscribers, but unfortunately they were coming in at the same rate that we were losing them, so we're at the exact same number that we started. Damnation! Damn it!
Damn it, we're working on it. We're working so on it. So does that mean I don't have to dance at the end? Oh no, you still. Yeah, we oh, have okay. two, two, two subscribers right. to dance for. Two subscribers to dance for. They but all hated me. Uh, th thank you guys <laughs> so much. No, that has it's not it has nothing to do with that. It has to do with us finding new people to even watch the content. It's a it's a Twitch discoverability problem, not a you problem. Ninety eight percent of our audience is already subscribed. This has nothing to That's do fair, with you. Fair. It's it's like, we, we have like such a high subscribe to audience, I hate even asking them to subscribe, because I'm like, I know the people who haven't just don't want to or can't afford to, and it's just like, I don't even want to bring it up, because you all watch every fucking I day. I use my free one to subscribe, the one I get for doing Amazon Prime. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I feel bad even bringing it up half the time, and I'm like, I know I should, but I feel bad, because I see all of you in the chat, I know who you are, like I know you are, I see you here every fucking day. I, I see you here all the time, so I don't want to make you feel bad. And, I make, and feel make you bad. feel pressured. That's stupid. Um, no, it's more a discoverability problem. So if we had more people tuning in, we'd get more. That's how it works. We're doing good Next stuff. Time. You were great. You Aww. had a good time. And uh, hope you guys had fun. I've only burped four times, so hopefully that wasn't too loud in the mic. I'm sure it was fine. <laughs> sure it was fine. Uh, so thank you guys, and thank you, Sarah. Make sure you hit her up on Twitter at the or at Sarah, Sarah the, the Rebel. Rebel. Sarah I'm Sarah the Rebel, Rebel everywhere. Instagram, Twitch, my my like Xbox. All of it. Patreon, please go to Patreon, subscribe for $3. You can get uh, special vlogs that talk about the process of writing, and then also you will always get short stories even if you just donate a dollar. So do it. Patreon.com slash Sarah the Rebel. Boom. Thank you guys so much. Podcast out. And now it's this part where I turn the alerts back on. Okay. Fuck shit. Dance. Wednesdays are just like the worst for me. Just the worst. Uh, I think it's partly these chairs too. Yeah, these are uh, these chairs fuck with my legs bad. They fuck with my legs. Yeah. They're very pretty. Yeah. Uh, I walked up Griffith yesterday like, uh, with yeah. um, Evil Dan Wallace. If any of you guys know him, because he's on stream stuff a bunch, and uh, he came to visit from Germany. And uh, the top butt muscle, because I don't know what the names of the different butt muscles are, but the one that's at the top is just like shot. Lifting my legs feels like I'm holding weights up. It's terrible. Oh wow! All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna mute this right here. Hopefully the speaker's on. Sometimes the speaker auto shuts off, so I might have to like, I might have to make sure it's still up and running. So don't don't be mad if I have to do that, guys. Don't be mad if I have to do the thing. I mean, you you'll hear the song. Well, actually, I could test with a I'll test with a follower alert. That's how I know then it's working. There we go. That way you don't have to hear the song all the times when we can't. It makes sense. I believe everything you're saying. Hey, speaker's on. It the is. speaker's on. We're going to do this thing. Oh, God. Maybe Thank you guys for tuning in to Hyper RPG. Stick around after the dancing. We're going to run a raid to a lucky individual, and we'll keep this party going, especially if you're just waking up on the <laughs> European <laughs> side of the world, hanging out. Uh, thank you guys once again for tuning in. So we've got a couple, uh, we got Power Bog subscribed. Woo woo. We got Me Dick. Me Dick. Yeah, Me Dick. Me Dick. Love Me Dick. Subscribed as well. Uh, thank you guys for those subscriptions. We really appreciate it. Um, I want to rename all my shit that now. <laughs> Me Dick. Me Dick. Me Dick. How do you pronounce that? Me Dick. <laughs> all right. All right. Let's, uh, Let's let's do this and power bog. This one's for you. Subscriber. Boom! That's one subscriber. Thank you so much for <laughs> subscribing to Hyper RPG. You guys are great. I want you all to know I don't dance like that, though. I My dick, this for is you. for you. <laughs> oh, no.
Boom! All right. Just for you. Just for you. Do they, do they rate everywhere. our dancing? <laughs> they, they rate everything, of course. One out of two. If it's out of two, then we do good no matter what. <laughs> really, that was the weakest booty shake I've ever done for you guys because this fell off and I was like, danger, danger, danger. Never mind. Danger, danger, danger. All right, so let's, uh, let's see here. I'm going to go over here and figure out who... We are raiding, I believe, I told, let's just see if it's still up. Look in here. Oh, wow. Okay. A lot of the... <laughs> Everyone went to bed. <laughs> yeah. Well, not everybody. Just a couple people I told if they were up, I would raid them tonight, but it looks like they... That's what I say to guys, and it never works the way I think it will. When you say that you're going to raid hey, them? Hey, if you're up, I'm going to raid you tonight. And they're mm. like, mm, oh, I've got a headache. <laughs> then I, do, I get nothing. going to fumigate my house? <laughs> you know, with rage. None of my sex euphemisms work, nor none of my being blatantly obvious. People just have to take my phone away and text for me. All right, well, that Bronze Girl's up playing Horizon Zero Dawn, which is currently my favorite game maybe ever. So we'll throw the raid over towards that Bronze Girl. You guys know what to do. Uh, you know how this works. You know what to do. Make friends, have fun, have a good time. Thank you guys for tuning in to Honest Hour. Stick around tomorrow on the channel. We've got Shy Guy Express. Tomorrow's a big day here. You're welcome to come by, by the way. What's, what's There's going to be a 12 hour long Nintendo Switch stream. Oh. Starting at midnight. You're, oh, you're fa I know you're. You're supposed to look happy right now. I mean, tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow, we're starting off the day with Shy Guy Express. Oh, wait, I'll be here tomorrow. Tomorrow's Thursday. Are you on the gauntlet? Yeah. You're on the, the gauntlet, gauntlet tomorrow? With Kiri Callahan, which, P.S., I don't know if he doesn't know what happens when the two of us get together, but it's about to be lit. Tomorrow on the gauntlet, <laughs> Sarah's here. I should have known that. I didn't fucking know it. Tomorrow on the gauntlet, yes. Sarah, uh, the gauntlet's Hopefully like they let me be a quickly barbarian. becoming my favorite show on the channel. And then we're going to fill the time in between the gauntlet and the 12 hour stream somehow probably be me playing Horizon Zero Dawn. Hopefully not because I have a flight at like 5 a.m. on Friday morning. You can take a nap and just stream that. <laughs> they can uh, pay to play uh, like, uh, what are those songs your mama sings? Nursery Guys, songs. Go raid. Get out of here. Bye. Bye. Have a good night. Go, go raid. Go, 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 go raid. Get out of here. Go, go, go. Do it for me. Go, 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 go.